Please stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Alderman Stray. I'm here. Alderman Kavieski. Here. Alderman Miller. Here. Alderman Rosick. Here. Alderman Shaw. Here. Alderman Ellis. Here. Alderman Zwart. Okay, the first item tonight is a public hearing. The purpose of the hearing is to hear public comment okay. on the proposed amendment to the City of Oconomowoc Comprehensive Land Use Plan 2010-2030 and rezoning 21.22 acres located south of Lisbon Road and west of Brown Street, immediately west of Oconomowoc Country Club Golf Course. Jason, you want to give a brief overview, then I will call uh, for uh, uh, comments from the public. Thank you, Mayor. Common Council, I will give the same uh, slide presentation that I gave to the Plan Commission back on May 9th. This application is for a rezoning and a land use plan amendment for, uh, it's the Lisbon Road property now known as the Towner Crest Senior Community uh, Project. Uh, the project is located, uh, it's on the south side of Lisbon Road, west of Brown Street, uh, directly across from Spruce Court. It's also west of the uh, Oconomowoc uh, Country Club golf course, uh, shown where the star is in this general area. So it's in the city, um, it's generally in the northeast part of the, of the city. Um, so on the location map here, you can see the area highlighted is, is a rough sketch that I put together showing the, um, the area that we're discussing this evening, uh, immediately west of the golf course, uh, south of some town of Oconomowoc residents, and south of Spruce Court, which is in the city of Oconomowoc. Uh, that is the general location for this area. The, uh, the, the darker areas shown on the map are, um, are wooded areas with, with trees, and then there's some, some lowland wetlands further to the west. Uh, this is the uh, survey of the property. You can see it's 21.2 acres in size. Uh, this is what they are officially requesting to amend the land use and the rezoning uh, with this application. The city has a land use plan. It identifies every property in the city. Uh, it has a, as a designation of what that land should be um, in the next 30 <laughs> years. Um, it uh, Currently, it was in the town, which was just recently brought into the city, lands in the town we, we identify as urban reserve, which is more of a holding zone until we know what the best use of that property is. So the request for the land use plan is to change this uh, 21 acres from urban reserve to high density residential. They're also asking for then to be consistent with the plan, if that's approved, to um, uh, change it was assigned a temporary urban reserve zoning district when it was brought into the city and uh, now they're asking that the zoning follow the land use plan to mirror that being the high density residential so this was the map that the applicant provided saying approximate rezoning area is the green striped area so this uh, direct annexation was um, accepted in February the plan commission recommended the annexation ordinance in March mm -hmm. The Common Council approved the annexation ordinance in April, and then the Plan Commission recommended this to the Common Council, the land use plan amendment and the zoning back on May 9th of this year. That was approved with a seven to zero vote, both of those items. Uh, so it comes to you with a recommendation. Um, so what is this recommendation and, and this change in zoning and land use plan for? It's the uh, Towner Crest Senior Community, it's Presbyterian Homes of Wisconsin. There's going to be a campus uh, with various levels of senior care, including a 24,000 square foot town center, then uh, some senior apartments, assisted living and memory care units, 158 total residential units. This is the site plan concept. Uh, this has not been approved yet, uh, but they are in for technical review on this right now. 
So you can see it's laid out in the same general shape of that we're acting on. This would accommodate that facility. Um, this is a, um, an enlarged site plan. It shows two access points out to Lisbon Road with various parking, uh, trail systems, and uh, the building is kind of spread out. Um, we have uh, these concept elevations uh, have gone before the Architectural Commission. There was just some one slight issue with the window color, but other than that, uh, they, they were um, approved that evening uh, on May 9th. Um, during the review process, we're asking what will this building look like when you're driving along the road? Um, so as you're starting and heading Heading uh, west and going up the hill, uh, you see the one on top here. There's some pine trees out near the road. Those are remaining. As you make your way right down the middle, right across from it, um, that's the middle photo. Uh, those pine trees are remaining. And then um, as you get further away, you have some uh, elevations there. So staff, we had some initial concerns with the rezoning and the land use plan. Uh, increase in traffic, impact to the community services, the, the wetland impacts, the building massing, the utility impacts, the fire department uh, coverage, can they handle this? And then the re concerns with the remaining parcel. And since those times, they have addressed every one of them. They've conducted a, a traffic study. They've shown that this use is bringing less traffic than if it was single family homes. They, as far as impact to the community, they have agreed to a pilot agreement. Uh, they've delineated the wetlands, and we know that they're not uh, affecting any sensitive lands. They've changed their building design and, and maintaining as many pine trees and evergreens uh, for year-round uh, screening. They, um, utility impacts, we, we did plan for something to go there. It's, this is actually less impact than single family. They've added fire lanes as, as requested. And as the remaining lands, they, they said they would be in favor of deed restricting that. Uh, most of it is, is wetland at this time. So if this is approved, what's next? Well, they need the, the detailed site plans. Those are currently in for review. Um, we are, are, are providing them comments. Um, there is a conditional use permit with a, con a CBRF, a community-based residential facility, that would require a, a public hearing before the, the Common Council. And the certified survey map that's in, and that's scheduled for the June 13th Plan Commission meeting. All of those items must be uh, reviewed and approved by the Common Council. So I'll leave uh, this up. Um, if there's any questions or concerns, um, I know I'd be available to answer questions later in the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. <clears throat> I'll take comments from the public. If you want to say something about this specific item, we'll take public comments on other issues after um, we complete the public hearing. I, I just have one question regarding this. Um, well, then I'll call your name. When oh, I thought you just. No, I, I said I will call names. <clears throat> if it, once I call the cards, and if anybody else has anything they want to add, then you can come up. Um, but <clears throat> with, the, with the large crowd we have here on some of the issues, um, it says on the cards comments should be limited to three minutes or less and don't duplicate uh, comments. Um, that way we'll get the chance for everybody to speak and give us a chance to deliberate uh, what we're going to be deciding tonight. So uh, first person up is Kent Tess Matner. Uh, he is from Wauwatosa. He's a part of Presbyterian Homes. I will give the name and uh, the address as much as possible. Thank you very much. Uh, I am the uh, chair of the board of Presbyterian Homes Wisconsin, and I just wanted to uh, share again with the Common Council uh, a little bit about Presbyterian Homes Wisconsin. Uh, the vision of Presbyterian Homes Wisconsin is to provide more choices and opportunities for more older adults to live well. Our uh, mission statement is to honor God by enriching the lives and touching the hearts of older adults. All of us who serve on the board are volunteers and uh, all of us are dedicated to the mission and making sure that the facilities are first rate and that the uh, residents are well taken care of. Uh, for years, we, uh, and we still do, but for years we uh, ran and we still run Avalon Manor in Waukesha downtown. We have Kirkland Crossing in Pewaukee. We opened about uh, two years ago Dixon Hollow in uh, Menominee Falls. This summer we'll be opening um, 
uh, a facility in Germantown, and we're trying to get a, uh, a, a group of uh, facilities in southeastern Wisconsin to help uh, with them. We do gra demographic studies as to need, and also if we get the uh, facilities in an area, we can help with staffing and things like that. Uh, I just wanted to let you know that we uh, run what we consider to be a first-class facility. We don't discriminate on religion, even though we are faith-based. And uh, we uh, don't require a down payment for people to come in. It's completely rent, uh, rental-based. And uh, we usually end up with a waiting list before we open the facilities. We look forward to uh, coming to Oconomowoc. The Towner Quest after Margaret Towner. Margaret Towner is still alive today, retired in Florida, but she was the first woman ordained as a uh, minister in the Presbyterian Church USA. And so we have a history of trying to uh, honor the uh, pioneers, and in particular the women pioneers in uh, the Presbyterian Church by naming of the facilities and also usually have a photo and a, and a little placard in the lobby explaining all that. We would love to bring one of our communities to your community and uh, can guarantee to you that it will be a first class facility and it will be a credit to the city. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Frank Habib. your address? Probably is right. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity. Um, if please, I come please here, state your name and address. Oh, certainly. For the record. Frank Habib, uh, Menominee Falls, Wisconsin. Um, I come here tonight as a neighbor of Dixon Hollow, the facility in Menominee Falls um, on the corner of Pilgrim and Lisbon Roads. Um, some of you are probably familiar with that, that part of the country. Uh, it's literally in my backyard. On a, on a clear day, I can see it. If I had a better arm, I could probably throw a rock and hit it. Okay, but it's in my backyard. So I know the facility inside and out. I saw uh, the land before it was there. Uh, I lived during the construction and I still live there. So I come here as a, as a testimony to how these places are built and run as, as a neighbor and a part of the community. It, pro it proved to be no inconvenience to our housing subdivision at all, the Graceland Housing Subdivision, which is literally abuts up against it, none. Uh, we had no major traffic issues. There were no construction issues. Obviously, there's construction noise, but construction is a finite process. It begins and it ends. So we know that. We figured that all out. So that wasn't going to be an issue forever. We saw that. It was fine. They, they talked to the neighbors when we were doing it. It wasn't a problem. It became a very integral part of our community in the fact that across the street from us is Brookfield, to the east of us is Butler, and to the north, obviously, is Menominee Falls. In fact, our homeowners association meets at the facility. They have a nice big conference room, so our homeowners meet over there on a quarterly basis to discuss the issues in the neighborhood. It's absolutely been a godsend for us because we can walk over it on a nice day. Nobody has to drive any place. We have seniors in our neighborhood. They can just walk over. We also have people who volunteer there in the neighborhood with some of the senior residents. There have been no noise inconveniences, and believe me, if there were, I would hear them. If you come to my house, I can show you. But no noise inconveniences. In the past three years, two major housing developments literally across the street from Dixon Hollow have started. One is completed and totally sold out. The second one has just started and beginning to sell. And we're talking homes in the neighborhood of three hundred and fifty to five hundred thousand dollars in value. And so again, selling well. And both were started after Dixon Hollow was built. So it was not an impedance to building. There's been no drop in property values. Uh, and in fact we have actually seen an increase. I get a card a week from a realtor wanting to buy my house. I'm not moving, I like it where I am. We have embraced Dixon Hollow. It's become a very important part of our community. We, we believe we have an intergenerational community. We have children, we have working adults, and we have seniors in the community. That's very important for aggressive, progressive community. And in fact, I have to say on behalf of my neighbors, we're glad it's there. Thank you very much, Mayor. Thank you. 
Uh, Lisa Albain from Presbyterian Homes. It's nice to see you all again. Thank you, Mr. Muir and council members um, for having us. I'll, I'll keep this short. Um, I just wanted to come before you again, reiterating what Jason and Kent and um, Keith have said and introduce my team as well. I'm here with Don Mazorik and Josh Padelko. Um, Don is the architect and Josh is the uh, civil engineer. A little bit of history about Presbyterian Homes Wisconsin. Um, Press Homes Wisconsin has been serving the Milwaukee community since 1957. And uh, you can see from the slide, the earliest um, senior living community with Press Homes Wisconsin was established in 1998. And as Kent said, the Fairway Knoll project actually is opening. Uh, we at CO next week in uh, Germantown, Wisconsin for our phase one. Um, some examples of our, our projects that Press Homes um, has built. Um, we've partnered with hospitals. This one in, in the top left corner is Interlude West Health. It's in Plymouth, Minnesota. It's a partnership with Alina and Press Homes, 50 skilled nursing beds and five care suites. And it was an $18 million project. Folkstone and Wyzetta in Minnesota is a full continuum of care. It's um, one of our larger communities. There's 255 units. It's a full continuum of independent living all the way through um, skilled nursing. We have hotel, condominiums, um, and 130,000 square feet of retail space as well. That was a $292 million project. Um, Woodland Hill in Hudson, Wisconsin is a partnership um, with DeVita Dialysis. They're connected to our community as well. And that is what we call a, um, a, it's a full continuum of care. And then Dixon Hollow that Frank was referring to in Menominee Falls um, actually was a 2016 top projects award winner. Um, so it's a great addition to their community. Here's some photos of Dixon Hollow. We really try to incorporate the design of the building that complements the surrounding community. So it's, um, it blends very well and we take advantage of the outdoor spaces as well. Uh, Fairway Knoll in Germantown is the one that's going to be opening here um, mid-June. Mid uh, it is right next to the Blackstone Creek Golf Course and very Germanic in design as you can see because it is Germantown after all. Some of the amenities that um, we have that we will have in this community in Oconomowoc, uh, a fine dining restaurant, linen tablecloths, seated um, dining menus, um, with the server at the table. Um, we have also a bistro, I'll show you a picture of that in a moment. Movie theater, state-of-the-art wellness centers, lots of gathering areas for residents to sit and either gather with friends or family members um, so that there's more to a community than just their apartment. On the left is a, a picture of what a bistro very similar to what it will look like in Oconomowoc and again you can just see the attention to detail and the quality of the community. Um, we take advantage of the outdoor spaces at the Oconomowoc site that we're proposing. We'll have um, a putting green in the backyard, beautiful views of the um, pine trees as well as outdoor fireplaces and I've had a request for a pickleball court. Before we ever go into a community we are very intentional about doing market studies and we use Maxfield Consulting Company that specializes in senior housing um, market demand studies. And they take into consideration several factors, three of which being the senior growth in the community, household values, and market competition. And as you can see from this uh, market demand study, the independent living in Oconomowoc, currently, 2018, there is a demand for 137 independent living, congregate living independent living apartments and as you can see that number continues to escalate and you look at the trends with baby boomers retiring there's only going to be more and more demand 
Um, assisted living, right now there is a, a demand for of 16, we're building 18. Um, in 2019, when we opened 2020, we only have 18 apartments that will be able to fill that need. But as you can see, that number as well continues to escalate. Memory care is a different story in Oconomowoc. Um, we have um, a commitment to our residents that currently live within our community. They don't want to move once they've, they live um, with us. And if there's a need for memory care, we feel obligated to offer that option for them to be able to stay within the community. Therefore, we are building a much smaller memory care community than we normally would on a, on a campus this size, um, only 18 units as opposed to 36 or 42. Um, so far, we started this project in October, reaching out to city officials. We've met numerous times with the city planner. We've had opportunity to meet with you all as well. We've gone door to door and met with the neighbors across the street from the community or the site that we're proposing to build upon. Um, we've had individuals call us directly and we've been responsive <coughs> to their individual questions and work to mitigate their concerns. Um, we've um, hosted a neighborhood informational open house meeting across the street and had about 20, 20 to 25 people there and I have to say the, the response from the residents was overwhelming. They had a lot of questions and once they were able to understand what we were proposing, they uh, felt uh, much more confident. Um, the Oconomowoc Golf Course as well, they've got a um, water issue on the sixth green and we're going to mitigate that for them. At this time, I'll have Dawn Wazork come up, if that's okay with oh, you, yeah. Mr. Mayor. <coughs> and she can talk about the site configuration. And Dawn is the architect. The architect, correct. Good evening, I'm Dawn Wazork with Inside Architects. I'm from St. Paul, Minnesota. And I've worked with Presbyterian Homes for about 20 years doing senior housing projects similar to this one. Many of the ones you saw earlier are ones that we've done, uh, including the uh, Dixon Hollow site in Menominee Falls that we're opening soon. This site we're proposing is very similar, a, a mini continuum we call it, so it'll have the independent living, assisted living, and memory care components to it. And we try to be cognizant that while we're housing many seniors in a building, we like it to blend into the neighborhood, and we step down the ends of the wings of the building to meet the residential single family homes and neighboring components. So in the site plan piece here, we're looking at the north end of the building that is closest to Lisbon Road would be one story in height. Shortly after it would step back to step up to two stories. The center of the building would be a two and a half to three story space where many of the town center features are and have taller ceilings. And then the arc at the south side of the site is the independent living apartments and it would be four stories for much of it, but the ends of each end of the wing would step down to three stories. So we try to give it a more gentle silhouette and approaching neighboring single family homes be like uh, similar in size. These are a few renderings of the proposed building. The upper left one is the entry canopy and that's that two and a half story piece and then to the left, you see the taller four-story independent living height size uh, wings. And to the right, you see the two-story assisted living and memory care wings. Uh, the top right photo is the courtyard view. The tall windows in the center are the common spaces that would look out to the beautiful pine forest and the amenities we would have in the courtyard. The assisted living wing is the bottom left, and you can see that the building steps down to just one story at the end of that. That's the closest to Lisbon Road. And then the, t the end of the independent living wings, the lower right, shows the tall four-story portion in the middle and the lower three-story portions on each side of it. The building is approximately 270,000 square feet. We have a 72,000 square foot footprint on the first floor with all the step backs and the portions that are less than a uh, complete story, um, the upper stories are many fewer square feet. We talked about the way the building steps and heights. We have 120 independent living units, 20 CBRF assisted living, 18 CBRF memory care, and approximately 24,000 square feet in the town center. 
We do meet the building height code, which is uh, less than 45 feet to the center line of the pitched roof. Uh, we exceed all of the building setbacks. We've got a large enough site and we like to give green space to our residents too, so we're exceeding, frequently doubling the required city setbacks. And we're trying to save as many of the existing trees for the natural beauty for residents and for the screening for the neighbors too. This view is from Highway 16. You can see kind of an A on the lower and then a section through showing the elevations and the berm along the highway and then the view up to the building. So you can see kind of the top of the fourth story of the building but not much else right where the A level letter is. If you go any further south, the berm completely obliterates the view of the building. So it's not going to be, even though we're sitting up on top of the hill, it's not as significant up there as you might expect from its sighting because of the way the elevations work. And as we're coming in, you can see the D line, D mark on the site plan looking in through the trees. You see the one and two story portions and then off to the right you see the three and four story portions. They almost look the same height because there's so much setback so much further from the road. Looking straight in at the end of the wing that's closest to Lisbon is C on the site map below is the one story portion and those two stories directly behind it but off to the left again you can see a little glimpse of the four story portion of the building and it doesn't look significantly higher because it's set back so much further. And the last one we did is kind of at the property line to the east right by the golf course on Lisbon Road looking back at the building and the trees and the growth and things screen most of the building. And we've got a little bit of traffic study that our civil engineer would propose if you're okay yep. with that, Mayor. John, just introduce yourself when you get up here. Good evening, everyone. Josh Padelko, Trio Engineering. Uh, very important to this project and development in this area was a traffic analysis, which we had completed for this project. It evaluated uh, Lisbon Road and the development, taking into consideration all the development that's occurred along this corridor and everything planned to occur along, along this corridor. Uh, taking that into account with our proposed project, uh, the findings of that were that our development does not change uh, the level of service or functionality of Lisbon Road, uh, which still, uh, although the traffic pattern has changed over the last uh, five to ten years with development, it still has a, a very high quality uh, level of service. Uh, our development will not make that uh, a negative or, or any worse, and what we actually look to do is make it better um, and we can do that a few ways. In doing our traffic analysis, our consultant uh, was on site counting cars. Um, they also were evaluating site, di site distances. Um, looking at the site itself, we verified in the field that each of our access points had appropriate site distance uh, for everybody on Lisbon Road and for people in and out of our project. Um, that, together with our uh, intent which our site plan showed to maintain bypass and acceleration deceleration lanes uh, at both entrances means we have a safer wider road within the public right-of-way uh, ensuring uh, safe movements in out and through the front edge of this development uh, what is unique about this property uh, topography vegetation both along Lisbon Road and uh, the slopes to the south of the building, uh, we're able to keep the vegetation uh, almost entirely uh, along Lisbon Road, uh, the, the exception being across from Spruce Court where we have a few trees that must come out for our entrance. Uh, with the plan, we wanted to get creative. And we're saving the trees but backdropping the trees with a, an undulating, very aesthetically pleasing berm uh, that'll uh, vary in height, but really is in a lot of cases about six feet or more higher than the first floor of our building. What that does is really kind of softens the view uh, even more of the building uh, to the street, providing this, this earthen and uh, secondary landscaping level behind those pines uh, from the outside 
looking in. Uh, and then to the south, we're saving all those pines intentionally, uh, siting the building to work with the topography and, and that vegetation. Uh, there is a, a small wetland area in the northeast corner of this property adjacent to the golf course that's staying. Uh, what that means out, out looking at this property is all the trees and, and small growth that's been coming up is staying un, untouched. Uh, our project will retain our stormwater, uh, manage it, and really kind of focus on the infiltration in an area south of the building. So instead of the water that used to go to the golf course, which uh, as Lisa had mentioned, the uh, golf course has experienced some standing water issues on hole six. Uh, we're able to keep that on site, manage it, infiltrate it, um, and, and do that uh, uh, along with a few other things to really help the golf course uh, have a better experience, uh, a better drainage outcome. Sanitary sewer and water main are both available for this property in Lisbon Road adjacent to our site. Uh, utilities are there, they work great for the project. Uh, I think it's a really nice use, what we heard in neighborhood meetings uh, was uh, a project like this really creates a park-like setting. Uh, we're taking the development and putting it in a consolidated area, preserving uh, a lot of the land in green space and parks uh, and trees. You don't get that necessarily with other types of development. This is a great way that uh, a lot of the neighbors that we had met with really latched onto as uh, a beautiful use of the property. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there were some questions that had, had arisen that uh, had um, been brought forward regarding um, we're a nonprofit organization and are we going to um, or would we be willing to enter into a pilot agreement and, and we voluntarily agreed to do that. Um, we have uh, several pilot agreements in place currently. Um, the earliest one was 27 years ago. It's still there, um, 1991, Lake Minnetonka Shores, and then all the way through 2017. Um, PHS has never defaulted on any of our pilot agreements. We own and operate all of our buildings, and we have never sold any of our buildings. We've served seniors for over 60 years, and we have a long history and, of that, and, and we don't intend on changing that at all. Um, our timeline, uh, we have secured and uh, we have a secured and executed purchase agreement in place. The annexation is complete. The technical review is in process. The architectural review committee has uh, approved the project with the exception of the windows. Um, plan use or the plan commission unanimously recommended our project and we're before you today. Um, the CSM, we're um, going to be presenting on the 13th of June and then the conditional use permit for the um, CBRF. Um, benefits to the community is um, we provide choice for the aging residents of Oconomowoc and you can see from the market demand study that there is a need for, for senior living here, um, and especially the independent living. And we're doing our best to meet that need. We're not meeting all of it. Um, but we're, we're doing our best to address the need here. We're providing 34 equivalent of full-time employees. Um, we're good neighbors, low impact, and there's a ton of volunteer opportunities. Press Homes um, had over 25,000 hours of volunteering um, company-wide last year. It's something we're very proud of. Um, financial benefits to the city of Oconomowoc with our project going into that location, that Lisbon Road Special East Assessment Fee of $132,000 will, um, will be paid by us. Um, the city is going to be determining what our impact fees will, but those are um, large as well. And then our annual pilot payment um, with a, a, a $32 million construction budget, um, which we're still working through what that's actually gonna be once we've gone through the RFP process, um, is approximately $176,000 in payment to the city every year. And the city assessor, once the building is built, will actually determine what that exact amount will be. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, John Schubarth. State your address. I'm Joan Schubarth. I live on Mohawk Ridge, directly across, right off of Lisbon Road, nearby. Um, I have to say that coming to this meeting 
I have a little bit of um, my confidence in the the public hearing system has been eroded. I was here in winter talking about the same thing. My concerns are not for the Presbyterian home in and of itself. I'm sure that's a wonderful project and it's quality living for many people. My concern is the location on Lisbon Road. When my neighbors and I were here in winter, that night Common Council voted it down and then about two weeks later, I don't know what happened, but it was back on the agenda again. That and then being told that we are to limit our comments to three minutes and we've just heard over 30 minutes from Pres Homes. So that's, that's kind of frustrating to they're, me. They're the petitioner, they have the right to do that. Okay, thank you, I wasn't aware of that. Also, um, so yeah, not knowing that, that was frustrating to me. It is being zoned as high density, keywords high density. Traffic um, studies might show that Lisbon Road can handle it, but I lived on Lisbon Road before the bypass went through and our neighborhood suggested that we have stop and go lights on Lisbon Road and Highway Z. And the, the traffic study said, no, no, you don't need it. We've done all of our traffic studies. But those of us that lived there knew what it was like to turn off of Lisbon Road and how high dense, highly dense that community is, right between Sandwich on a Hill, between a now a bypass and a very highly densely populated Highway P. Within a year, due to high number of accidents, stoplights were put in there. So we can't just rely on these traffic studies. This traffic study, is supposed to be taking into account the incoming um, homes that are to be built, but it's going to be like three times. I, I can't even tell you. I don't know, but I'm sure you have seen the maps for how many homes are to go in where Pine Ridge is and behind between Lisbon and Highway Z. So those are going to be added on. And then we're talking about elderly people who don't make a lot of trips, but when they do, they have slower reflexes. There are so many beautiful settings in Oconomowoc that maybe have a safer on and off versus Lisbon Road where people go up and down 40 miles an hour at the top of a hill. You're looking into the sun, sunrise and sunset. I feel like that they picked it because they're gonna make a great profit because it's a beautiful area. They're in it for profit. I'm in it for the quality of life for the people that live in that neighborhood. And I have, like I said, nothing against the senior living community. The memory care center that's just the, up the road is only half full. So I don't know how those numbers were figured. Yep, there might be uh, a need for it in the future, but right now the current memory care and the current senior housing in Oconomowoc is not filled. So I'm very frustrated. I don't feel heard. I don't feel like the council or the land use committee are really hearing the residents. I feel like there's maybe already a plan. My husband said don't come. They probably already have it figured out, but I felt like as a, a member of the community, I needed to voice my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Gary Tessman. Thank you. I live on Mohawk Ridge also, okay. and uh, I had been at the previous meetings about this and spoke about it. And the one thing that uh, I know I, I, that came up to me recently is that in my opinion, this really is not a residential property. There are apartments in it, but it, what it is, it's a commercial property. You have people that are going to be employed there. You're going to be having meals served there. You're going to have trucks coming in there. And, and if you look also at other uh, projects like this in the area, such as Shorehaven and um, Lake Country, uh, th those are, are all located in commercial areas with high density traffic lanes and roads. One is on Highway 16, the other is on Highway 67. That's really what you need for a project like this, not into a residential area. And Lisbon Road, in my opinion, all the way, is a residential road, it is not a commercial road. And we don't need anything like this, this high density and the traffic it's going to present uh, in the area, we simply do not. Um, the, if a project like this comes in in the Oconomowoc area, my recommendation would be to look at the Olympia site. There's plenty of room there and it could work very well there 
and it is a, a commercial area, and the traffic flow would work out fine. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments on this particular project? Did you have a comment you wanted to have on this project? of how far along it has gotten until, until I saw all the slides. But in the event that it doesn't take place for whatever reason, unless it's totally a done deal, does that mean the zoning is permanently changed or is the zoning being changed just for this specific project? Steve Schaefer said yes. Okay. okay, thank you. Any other comments on the Presbyterian homes? Seeing none, we will close the public hearing and move on to regular business. Uh, first item is approval of meeting minutes from May 8th, 2018. We need a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. moved. Second. Any questions? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Minutes are approved. Uh, now we'll open up our comments and suggestions from citizens on other subjects. Um, <clears throat> I have several cards here. Again, if anybody has it, anything they want to say on any subject, um, we're going to try to limit it to three minutes, try to get through as many people as we can. So I'll be calling names in, uh, in no particular order, just the way cards the way I have them. Uh, first, though, we have a presentation from uh, Jerry Bratz. He may speak a little longer than three minutes, but we'll try to keep him as tight as possible. Three and a half. Thank you, Mayor. There were too many jump drives from the other presentations, so I have to get his set up, so bear with me for a minute. As Jerry is getting set up, uh, Jerry was hired, he's with UW Extension to perform a needs assessment for the Parks, Recreation, Forestry Department as well as the Public Library. Uh, he has presented the results to the Park and Recreation Board as well as the Library Board and he's going to be providing a summary to the Council this evening on the assessment. Uh, the results of this assessment will be used for future long-range planning, uh, strategic planning for the City and the Common Council. So Jerry, thank you for being here. So um, we um, spent uh, a good amount of time analyzing a needs assessment for both the Parks, Recreation, and Forestry Department and the Oconomowoc Public Library. Um, this process started last October, and um, we, um, again, we, this was presented to the Library Board and also to the Parks, Recreation, and Forestry Board um, last month. Just a quick overview of demographics. Um, as you see, the city of Oconomowoc has a growing population. Um, projections show projections by the UW-Madison uh, Applied Population Laboratory show that the city by 2030 will have over 20,000 residents for the first time. And um, that's almost double the population since 1990. Also, um, due to population growth, there'll be considerable household growth. By 2030, projections show that there'll be over 8,500 households in the community. So just a quick overview of this needs assessment process. Um, we did a random sample uh, questionnaire of both renter households and homeowner households within the city of Oconomowoc. 1,118 questionnaires were mailed out and we had 401 responses for a 38% uh, response rate. 
we also, I also did focus groups with youth, young adults, business leaders, and senior citizens that I gave initial 37 participants um, that provide additional qualitative input to this process. We also, um, the library board asked us to look at um, residents who used the, who checked out materials at the library from outside the community. So we focused on these four communities because they had the largest number of checkouts at the Oconomowoc Public Library. So um, this was an additional questionnaire we mailed out that had a 24% response rate, all from residents who were non-city uh, residents. So we looked at, a, this was a, again, a random sample. So the margin of error for the library survey combined with both city and non-city residents was 3.8% margin of error. For parks, recreation, and forestry, it was 4.8%. So just a quick overview of, the re, of some of the summary results of the needs assessment for park, recreation, and forestry. Um, overall, over nine out of 10 um, respondents said that um, the importance of having a high quality parks, recreation, and forestry department in the city is uh, very important or important. So that was over, that was over nine, nine out of 10 respondents. If you looked at quality ratings overall, um, again, over 91% 90, 90, of respondents said that city parks and recreation overall, um, the quality was good or excellent. We asked uh, participants in the survey of um, how often they've used a city or visited a city park and um, if they've used a, or participated in a recreation program. And um, again, there was high use of of uh, city park usage. 91% um, again said they used the city park over the past 12 months with the highest frequency being between three and six times. 45% in addition had used the city recreation program highest frequency between one and two times. Then we looked at five-year priorities. We asked uh, residents um, over the next five years to rank um, these priorities. Highest priorities were for more nature walk areas and paved bike trails. Um, these were the only two where um, over half or more of the respondents said this is a high priority for the city. Then we focused on the on the pavilion restroom at the Village Green. We asked uh, participants, um, would they support year-round restroom? 74% said yes. Only 14% said no. Um, slightly, slightly over half uh, supported a warming house. And um, there was less support for a fireplace or an indoor kitchen. Switching over to the public library. Again, over 83% said that a high quality public library um, is important or very important. When we looked at quality ratings for the public library, 79% felt the overall public library uh, quality was, was uh, good or excellent. Only 8% indicated it was fair. Then we asked uh, participants if they had a library card, either from the Oconomowoc Public Library or from another public library in Waukesha or Jefferson County, since both counties are part of the Bridges Library System and 79% said yes, um, they have library cards. Then we asked about frequency of use of the Oconomowoc Public Library, and 72% of 
respondents said that their household had made a visit in person to the Oconomowoc Public Library over the last 12 months, or over the past year. Most common uh, visits were one to two times or three to six times. 45% had accessed library um, information by computer. 28% had called the library to request information by telephone. And 18% had used downloadable media that the library provided as a resource. Then we focused on, I'm um, not sure why this slide's not working correctly, but um, we looked at five year service and program priorities for the library and Wi Fi internet access um, was the highest priority for over half of respondents. Next tier of importance was children's programming, computer workstations, summer reading program ebooks, audiobook downloads, and interlibrary loan. And we looked at space priorities for the library and um, the highest uh, space priority needs as indicated in this needs assessment were early literacy corner for children and a public computer space. So just quickly summarizing, um, again, the findings were large majorities set a high quality parks, recreation, and forestry department and a high quality public library were important or very important to the overall quality of life of the city of Oconomowoc. Large majorities rate parks, recreation, and forestry service as well as public library services as good or excellent. Websites and newspapers are the most common sources of information that people uh, use to get information about parks, recreation, and forestry, and the library. Nature walks and paved bike trails are the highest priority for parks, recreation, and forestry. Year-round bathrooms at the Village Green were the most popular potential addition to that area. Wi-Fi internet access is the highest priority for library services and programs in a children's early literacy corner and public computer space are the highest space priorities for the library. Um, and just finally, how this needs assessment can continue to be utilized by the city is um, as you embark on a strategic plan process, um, this information can be used as a, the first part of the strategic plan for both the Parks, Recreation, and Forestry Department, the environmental scan part of the strategic plan. It can also be used, this data can also be used uh, uh, for the department and the public library to uh, create strategic plan goal development and use this data for benchmarking as well to um, measure uh, outcomes. Any questions? Uh, no, not right now, I don't think, but it was a very good presentation. I think it uh, provided us with a lot of information. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Jerry. Uh, just so the council understands and the public as well, I want to thank the people that participated in the focus groups. We can't uh, do projects like this without volunteer participation. And for those who filled out the survey, uh, we will be creating a, the full report will be put on the city's website for everybody to see and will be sent out to all the elected officials so you can see the details behind the summary that was presented tonight. Great. John, John could I get a copy of what he just read off of? The slideshow and the actual data and questions that were the basis for the study? Yes, we can provide that to you. Not just the summary, I want every, the back. Yeah, we'll give you the full report. Jerry will pass out a copy of the presentation that he did this evening. Thank you, Mayor. Great, thank Thanks. you. <laughs> okay, now we'll open it up for general questions or general discussion on any item. Um, and again, um, try to limit it to three minutes so we can get to as many people as we can. And I know people are going to duplicate comments, but don't overdo it, I guess. Paulette Travers? State your address, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, 1438 El Dorado Drive, um, just a couple blocks from Nature Hill. Uh, good evening. First off, um, 
I want to say that I am not Cruella de Vil. <laughs> I grew up with Jiggers, an English setter, Tag, a golden retriever. Our kids had Danny, a miniature schnauzer, and Patsy, a shih tzu. Our grandkids have Caliber, a German shepherd, and we take care of Maya, our neighbor's black lab, when they're gone. However, I do not care to be around dogs I'm not familiar with. Twice last week, I had to scoot to the edge of a downtown sidewalk to avoid being sniffed by dogs. I don't want to encounter numerous dogs when we go to a city park. You can set all the rules and regulations you want, short leash, pick up after your dog, keep them on path pathways, and I bet that most of the dog owners will think that those rules don't apply to them and their dog. Dogs are supposed to be leashed at Nature Hill. At least 90% of the dogs I see there are off leash. When owners are asked to leash their pets, they often say they don't have to. Their dog would never hurt anyone and is very friendly. To me, it's unreasonable to think we could confront owners when they will not be willing to follow, when they are not willing to follow the rules the council sets. With the indignation and temper that people often exhibit, I am hesitant to call out anyone when they are not following the rules for their pets. Lately, the argument from owners to allow dogs in parks is that dog owners have to put up with children. That's the silliest thing I ever have heard. I mean, apples are being compared to oranges. I don't want to be sniffed or licked by a dog. I'm asking the city to please build a fenced dog park while the dogs can have fun and roam. I can stay away and enjoy the city parks that were built with the children and the adults of our city in mind. Thank you for listening and for considering what I've said. Thanks. <coughs> uh, Dev, Trevor. Uh, Honorable Mayor and members of the City Council, uh, I'm Dev Traver, 1438 Eldorado Drive. Uh, with Paulette, I also live close to Nature Hill. Uh, I'll just comment on Nature Hill because I use that a lot in the fall, in the spring, when the weather's conducive to running, I run. And I love it up there, the trails are nice, you get a lot of good hill works, but invariably, whether I'm running early morning, midday, I always run into dogs. Quite often, I'll see the dog long before I see the owner. Big sign, everybody's got to be on a leash if you're a dog but it really doesn't apply. Now, I will say most of the dogs pretty well behave and they leave me alone, but I've been jumped, I've been licked, and when you're running, I don't like to be, I don't like to have to change what I'm doing. I'm always respectful of whoever I'm coming up against, let them know I'm there so I don't scare them. But when I come around a corner and I'm face to face with a dog that I don't know, and then the, the owner's over there and they got a big grin on their face and oh, he won't hurt you just like she said. And, and normally they don't, but you never know. My point is, if you're gonna have all these rules and regulations, if you're gonna allow dogs in parks, how are you gonna enforce it? How many citations have you written to people in Nature Hill for not having their dogs on a leash? I'll just ask that question, do we know? Yeah, so my point is, um, I love dogs. I don't own a dog and don't plan on owning a dog, but I'm, many of my best friends have dogs, so I'm very familiar with that. And I love, love ones that I know, but the ones I don't know, I'm you know, not happy to interact with unless they're on a leash that I know is controlled. And uh, I've got kids and grandkids and none of them ever sniff somebody's crotch or lick somebody who didn't want to be licked. <laughs> so if that's that argument. So that's, thank Thanks. you for listening. <laughs> uh, Barb Jamerson. <coughs> Good evening, my name is Barb Jamerson. I think you might recognize me. Give your address, please. Uh, 893 Golden View Court of Hanamock, Wisconsin. Mayor Nold, Council President Alderman Shaw, and Alderman of the Common Council, thank you for the opportunity to speak and your patience as I read what I've written. I've tried to be brief. It was difficult. Um, I would like to address the fact that I find the city planner's initial report on Casey's to be negligent in completely omitting any reference of adverse effect 
or impact to our 113 families in Thoreau's Golden View Estates. And so we collectively have appeared before you presenting legitimate, oh, I lost my place, um, presenting legitimate adverse effects which would result from this project, only to have them cast away by Casey's attorney as personal preferences. I would like to note at the past planning commission meeting, Mr. Stephen Ritt called out our 113 families saying basically that we need to just suck it up. Something will be built there and it could be worse than Casey's. Later that same night, riding the elevator down with Mr. Ritt, when I asked what could be worse, a comment was made by a gentleman I believe to be a city alderman, said, hmm, well, it could be a strip joint. Really, when we take time out of our busy lives to come before you and respectfully ask that you consider what you are taking away from us, jeopardizing our quality of life, directly impacting the value of our homes by changing our location from one minimal traffic to a low traffic to high traffic, and this does affect our market values. Instead, our concerns and statements are written off and flippancy, written off with flippancy and referred to as personal preferences of which hold no value. Is it not interesting that this attorney's assessment of the traffic impact is sheer speculation? Where is the traffic study? Where are the definite statistics, projections, and evidence supporting her argument? Her reasoning that there will be no new traffic, only existing traffic normally going by. Is that not speculation? And where is the evidence that the hazardous waste runoff expected to drain into Casey's detention pond to be located very near our retention pond will not leach underground into our pond. Will Casey's be paying for the maintenance of our pond? Speculation, personal preference. Or is this acceptable to you because she is an attorney? In addition, when you add all this up regarding Casey's, we have been given proof the city planner privately negotiated with Pioneer Ridge Condos the transference of a piece of land that would eliminate the need for a public hearing of which we were promised regarding the apartment construction project. Again, another increase in traffic flow into our subdivision and now we have learned the city's public works director's answer to relieve the stress of excessive traffic is to remove the gate at the north end of Lapham Street, put a stop sign at each end of the historical metal bridge, and let one car pass one at a time. We understand this is your answer to bypassing the DNR and providing us with the second ingress egress. Seriously, have you all not thought about this through? There will be a constant backup of vehicles on both sides of the bridge as soon as people realize they no longer need to drive around town or the bypass to access Wisconsin Avenue more direct. May I be so bold as to ask who is the city planner and the common council really serving? Is it normal practice to negotiate terms with a developer in order to shut down or ignore the voice of the people of the city of Oconomowoc? those of us who you represent. There are so many better, larger, alternate locations within the city for Casey's business. How much and how far are you all willing to go to defy the voice of the constituents and destroy the tranquility, safety, monetary value, and quality of life we know today? I encourage all of you to continue to develop our city, but hear the voices of your constituents. Please develop responsibly. And because, not because, somebody is standing there with a $100,000 contribution we keep hearing about. Please vote this down. 
Thank you. <clears throat> Please keep your comments to three minutes or less. Angie Black. going to be really brief. I am that attorney for cases uh, to which there was just a reference made. I just wanted to let you know that we were here with a member of the design team to answer questions. Um, we've given you a lot of additional information and effort to address public comments, staff comments, and comments we heard at the plan commission, and, and that's in your packet. So, But we are available to answer questions if you have any. Thank you. Uh, it's Diane. I'm assuming that's you. Yep. No, just state your last name. <laughs> Um, I have a, a bunch of different issues. M my first one is we have a real problem with parking downtown, and I don't know if it's all attributable to all the construction workers at all the major sites, but there were some of us driving around for over 15 minutes this week. You guys were in a common council meeting, I think at the rec center. There wasn't a place to park, not on the street, not in the back parking lot. I grabbed the last spot that's across the street in your little tiny building so that I could go see somebody in the police department. There is a horrendous parking problem since these three big condominium projects are going on. And I don't know if it's all the construction workers, but I am not the only person constantly driving around this city to find a place to park. And I don't see that it's going to get better this summer. Here is possibly a solution. How these three, three developments get together and get a shuttle bus from the, from the school district for the summer and have, see if you can get some parking space available so that the construction workers can park in the vacant site now that's just by the railroad station where the business went out of business in March. They've got giant parking lots. You know, people would love to park their bi boats there, I'm sure, all summer long. But it would be really nice if there was some kind of shuttle service provided for the construction workers because they take up too much space. And now I understand the space, the, the street, I, mean, I can't even tell you what street it is. Right across the street from the church is going to be shut down for, for um, construction. You know, that whole street is p filled with your construction workers. That's one issue. Um, I'd like to know where we stand on dog bites. So I was with a friend this week. We were walking. Ten days ago, we had a, a black lab come out and chase us, you know, jumped up on the other person. We both had two little dogs under 10 pounds. This week, the same woman was out with her dog. The same dog came and attacked her dog. The dog was in six hours of surgery yesterday. You know, the dog happens to live in my neighborhood. It's the third time, the third time that we've been chased, twice in the last 10 days, once a couple of years ago. So we filed, she filed a complaint. They called me and asked me if I would, and I was walking around Fowler, so I went to the police station today to do it. And a police officer went to her house yesterday, took a statement, didn't leave a name. She has no idea who he was. I wouldn't have let you out my door without knowing who you were. But she had no idea who the officer was. He's off for the next two days. He honestly said he has no idea what the protocol is. How many times does a dog have to bite before something happens to you, before something happens to the dog? Somebody from the county called this other woman and told her that it's very likely you better start carrying a baseball bat or pepper spray because a dog that bites once has it in their system now that they're going to go after the same dog or the same person again. So I guess my question is, and maybe it's to you know, I'm, I'm sure we don't have a canine officer here. Does anybody have any idea or could we get find out how many times or what the protocol is in the city of Oconomowoc when a dog bites a person or another dog or chases them more than once, do we have any guidelines as to what's supposed to happen to that dog? Mm -hmm. I have a dog. I have a therapy dog. She weighs 10 pounds. You know, it's very scary. Lots of dogs are behind their own fences, either regular fences or underground fences. You know, this dog was not. This dog was even, this time it was out with its own owner and it pulled away from the owner. Last week the dog was just sitting in its lot, no fence, no underground fence, no chain, no anything. So that would be something I would like to know. And comment on, I was here two weeks ago and you talked about just a kudos to all of you who, I know it was a kind of a split, the mayor made the decision on the pit bulls. In the last 30 days there have been four deaths for pit bulls, including one in Milwaukee. All but one. There were eight in the last month. All but one were owned by the homeowners. They weren't stray dogs. They weren't running around. They were family dogs, and they managed to kill somebody in their family, including one in Milwaukee. So I'm very happy. I feel bad for people who have pit bulls. They terrify me. It could be any kind of dog. Dog parks. I would never go to a dog park. I think Oconomowoc needs a dog park. Do I really want you to open up 
pooping in Fowler Park and in the band shell? No, I do not. But I think the city needs some place for people who want to take their dogs to run their dogs. I would never use it. I do, however, think that you can't put signs up on the boardwalk, no dogs allowed. People, hundreds of people walk around Fowler Lake every single day. I don't want to walk between the cars in a full parking lot with my dog or my children and have to worry about cars backing out. I think the signs on the, bo on the boardwalk need to come down as far as that you can't walk your dog on the boardwalk. Yes, there are always going to people, be people that never pick up their crap, excuse the word, but that's what it is. There are people that are not going to do it. Hallett Vet is gracious enough to put out poop bags all around. People still don't use them. So um, the gentleman who just spoke a minute ago about the parks and recreation, about focus groups, I didn't notice on the biggest group of focus groups, I would think the biggest group of people living in Oconomowoc are people between the ages of 35 and 55, somewhere in that. I noticed all the other groups of people, and there weren't very many people, nobody ever contacted me, I'd be happy to be on a focus group. I, that, that group seemed to have been missing in the list of people that were in focus groups. Maybe I missed it, but I read it twice. Um, I think if you're going to go ahead with this plan community for senior citizens, you should at their expense write it in that a traffic light needs to be at the exit point onto the main road. Because I'm going to be a senior, pre, I'm pretty senior now. I still drive pretty well. There's no question that our reflexes aren't always as great and we don't always make as good of decisions. I think a traffic light needs to be part of the plan that this organization is paying for to get onto a major road. Um, bike tunnel. Is anything happening with the bike tunnel that was planned and was kind of shut? We're well past the three minutes now. Okay. I'm trying to keep this so we can get as many people to talk as possible. Okay, then I'm done. Thank you. <coughs> Brian Lurch. Good evening. Um, I guess I just wanted to start with, I didn't know we had any spots that we could even walk dogs here in Oconomowoc. I thought there were dogs were banned in all the parks, but um, That'd be great to have a, a dog park. That'd be, because um, like I said, I don't, didn't think there was any place we could walk them. Um, <clears throat> it, it was said very well already, but I um, have lots of concerns about uh, Casey's and the, the, the gas station there. Um, I think it's interesting that with um, the assisted living, we've had a number of people come forward and talk about the good that they've done and that kind of stuff. There's nobody coming to talk up the uh, the gas station, like how the assisted living has been a, a great neighbor in helping folks and that kind of thing. Um, one of the issues that I've raised previously here was the um, the property value, and that was kind of uh, poo pooed. People said, "Well, there's all these other gas stations, and you know that hasn't brought crime or any issues." So. I drove by the other gas stations and went up a block or two and the homes that surround the other gas stations are very different from the homes back in the subdivision there. Um, these are $400,000 homes, very different from the really broken down homes very close to the other gas station. So I think it's really a poor comparison that way. Um, I do think that the gas stations do bring crime, do bring a lot of problems. So I uh, want to definitely bring that up as well. But um, yeah, I, I think that uh, there are legitimate concerns and really feel that it should be really listened to. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Chris Kurtz. Hi, my name is Chris Kurtz. I live on uh, Juno Avenue, uh, right across. Your, you want to give your address? Oh, yeah, N52 W37203 Juno Avenue. Um, my concern is uh, the, the talk I've heard about the, the bridge and the solution for the, the stop signs and opening up the gate. Um, I'm all for opening up the gate. I got no problems with that. My concern is uh, the amount of non vehicle traffic that, that uses that bridge. Uh, my kiddo and I ride our ride our bikes to uh, take her to school. I see uh, a, a ton of kids come blowing out that sidewalk from Riverside Park 
uh, either go fishing on the bridge or come across the bridge to uh, Erding Park, I think I'm pronouncing it right. Um, my concern is that bridge is barely big enough for, uh, for a car to get, one car to get on if another kid is uh, hanging out there, if a family's sitting there fishing. Uh, my concern that that stop sign uh, idea on either side would, would just not be enough there. I think there'd be way too much traffic uh, and way too many kids uh, running around that particular neighborhood. The streets aren't very wide on either end of that bridge, so to, to, to propose traffic to go two ways there is, um, again, I'm just concerned about bikes and kids and fishing and stuff. So thanks for your time. Thank you. Uh, Juliet Steitzer. Good evening, Juliet Steitzer, N52 W37140, Juno Avenue. This is my neighbor over there. Um, yes, did catch wind that uh, there's been a proposal to open up the gate, allowing two-way traffic as a uh, way to mitigate any traffic concerns that might be um, pressured, you know, pressure on that road because of the opening of Casey's. And if that is what you're considering, I would suggest that you reconsider that possibility. The bridge uh, was originally um, left in place when Thoreau Farms was developed. In 2004, there was a moratorium for 10 years on, uh, on building anything, on widening the bridge at all. Again, largely due to um, concerns for the residents of the area, but also concerns for the Thoreau Farms development that um, they also didn't want Lapham Street to become a thoroughfare. Um, the, the neighborhood, the Thoreau Farms, was developed with that in mind, with the idea that Lapham Street would remain a quiet residential place, and all the people who've built there in the last 15 years have relied upon that not being a thoroughfare. Since that time, the uh, railroad crossing that had been present across from uh, that stoplight has been closed where uh, Retzloff used to be. Now I don't know, I think the city, I think the school district owns a piece of that now. Um, that, again, uh, reduces the amount of crosstown traffic that might occur, but widening that bridge doesn't seem economically feasible for the number of residents that you would serve. And, leave, and, and opening the gate is a, is, would be a catastrophe. Uh, if you think that, <laughs> I mean, I live on that street. I live on the little stub Juno Avenue on the opposite side of that bridge. And I encounter my neighbors coming and going almost every time that I leave the house, either kids on the bridge, people walking their dogs on the bridge, or one of my neighbors coming in and out of that neighborhood. Um, so to open that to a, a huge number of people, you're gonna have people stopped and backed up, blocking the entrance to Erding Park, blocking the exit to Riverside Park. And don't forget, Lapham Street makes a quick jog. It doesn't, it's not like there's a, on the north side of Lapham Street is a strange jog in the road where there's somebody's property. And then if you have two or three cars parked, or not parked, but waiting to pass at that stop sign, they will not be able to go up abutting Washington. It's, it's, it would be crazy to have cars backed up in either direction in that particular location. So uh, if that's an effort to get around the DNR rules, I don't know that there's a, a way to get around that. You either have to widen that bridge and buy out the people, or you're gonna have to leave the gate in place and, le and you can't open it to two-way traffic. No way. That's what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Scott Hughes. Okay, Scott Hughes, 388 North Lapham Street. I'm just here talking about obviously all this stuff that's going on with the gas station and stuff. Obviously, I can't stop anything that's going to be built that somebody bought and purchased there. It's not an optimal business to put right there. So. I've never been here before to say anything until I found out about the opening of the bridge. I live right on Lapham Street. Many people here see me sitting out there with my dog every afternoon. And just the traffic that goes through our neighborhood is great. My only concern is opening that bridge to where it will turn it into a thoroughfare. And we've already talked about speed bumps, which apparently we can't do. So we're going to add traffic going through the neighborhood. It, I'd, I'd rather take the worst of two evils with the congestion at the gas station if that's our only choice. I mean, other than that, I, I don't know what to say. I think it's all a bad idea, but once again, businesses have a right to open. I'm not one to stop that. Obviously, a little strip mall there would be a nicer thing than a gas station, but I have no control over that. My only concern is, like I say, the bridge, all the little kids in the neighborhood, 
what they see riding their bikes because they are little kids out into the street occasionally and turning that into someone going through 35, 40 miles an hour in a 25 is not a safe situation. And that is my major concern with all this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rich Fominski? I, I, I'm sorry, I just can't quite make this out. So I, I have nothing prepared because I, I actually, this is Rich Smiska, I'm at 562 okay. Thorough Drive. I'm one house removed from Lapham and the gate. Um, I actually thought this was a sign-in, so I didn't really prepare anything. Oh. But from listening to all, to everybody here, and the emotions and passion that they have for the community, I want to ask the council and to you, Mayor Nold, isn't your responsibility as a council to increase the value and the value of life of the community? Within a less than a two-mile span, we have four gas stations. How many gas stations do we need in two miles? I mean, if this was a veterinary clinic or uh, a uh, doctor's office or something that brought value and <coughs> to the community, I'd say I'm all for it. But a gas station to sell more liquor, to sell more gas, to sell more Yahoo or whatever the kids are drinking nowadays, I, I think it's ridiculous that we have to add another gas station where we have Speedway and that BP, and we have we have Quick Trip and another BP. It's 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 crazy. We moved here two years ago, found Thorough or Golden View Estates, and and it was perfect for for my family and myself. The gate was a blessing because just knowing all the neighbors and how people fly, not knowing the subdivision, they fly up and over that hill, and they come to a screeching halt, basically right before the gate, fly backwards into thorough and fly back and it's 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 crazy so if if this is going to bring some kind of value to the community i'd say all for it but just so that kids can hang out in another gas station another parking lot and that, that that's my only that those two items uh are uh, are my issues so i thank you for your time great thanks uh mike brink Uh, hi, Mike Brink, 551 Thorough Drive. Um, I had a couple of things. First about the gas station. Um, from what I saw based on the plans, I was kind of concerned with, I know that they were going to redo <coughs> parts of Sheldon Avenue. Now, what I propose to the Casey's gas station is instead of just buying that one piece of property to purchase the two rundown houses that are at the end of that street and use that, use Sheldon Avenue as the exit and entrance instead of coming on to Lapham. And then one other question I have is when I, well not a question, when I come out of Lapham to pull out to Wisconsin Avenue, probably two to three times a week I see cars run that red light constantly. Now I have seen police officers sit over by the VFW to try to monitor that, but it, I haven't seen an accident yet, but I've seen several close ones. So to me, that's, it's just a really dangerous spot. And then also with the traffic to open up that dead end of Lapham, my only question that I guess I would ask is, I know that there's a gate there and I'm assuming that the gate's there to open up in event of emergency with the fire department that would need to open the gate to get to the residents on Juno. What um, what is the capacity of that bridge? Like, what if a truck or a heavy load were to take that route instead of just normal residential traffic? Could the bridge support that, even though it is a, a single lane bridge? That's really all I have. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Eric Ludwig. Thank you. Uh, Eric Ludwig, 195 North Lapham. Thank you guys for uh, listening. Been here for Plan Commission and Council. Um, you have a unique piece of property with the Casey General Store, so I'm here to speak in opposition to that, as well as the potential to open the uh, gate at the end of Lapham. You have a unique piece of property. I know what it's zoned for. 
I know we're not here to argue what business is supposed to be there or tell a business how they're supposed to be. Nobody has come here and said, we don't want Casey's in Oconomowoc. We've said, we don't want an unsafe property or business in a location where it doesn't belong. Um, everybody that's here and in the extra room, because there are so many people here tonight, whether it's for Casey's or dogs or alcohol, there is a lot of concern because it's justified. Whether it's kids, cars, people exiting in Lapham, people exiting in Wisconsin, there are a lot of problems. Casey's states that there's not gonna be an increase to traffic. Well, there's already an increase. We just saw it on the uh, research slide where we're gonna have another 3,000 plus people in town in the next 13 plus years. That's gonna increase traffic. I'm more concerned about the change in the traffic pattern. So now you're gonna have people exiting onto Lapham, you're gonna have people exiting onto Wisconsin even more frequently from Sheldon with the $100,000, that's not gonna do all of that road, by the way. I don't know how that's not gonna cause a problem. For anybody that uses that as their entrance and exit to the city on a daily basis, or even infrequently coming into town, it is a problem. Especially in the morning, in the afternoon, during rush hour, it is a problem. Anybody slows down to take a left into the VFW, or slows down to take a right even into the neighborhood, usually I'm stuck behind somebody who's trying to cut the other people in the left lane off to go straight because it goes from two lanes down to one. I'm a, I felt a little bit better, but not much, listening to the people from Towner Center uh, who had the exact same concerns that I did. Things are moving very quickly. Citizens are not being aware of what's going on or being given time, ample time to prepare, discuss, or be able to come here tonight. The turnaround time for somebody with a family that has kids, it's not very easy to come here and speak. And it's intimidating, to be honest, to be able to come up in front of you and everybody here to even be able to express these thoughts and feelings on a very complicated subject that impacts us. So just wanted to come here and speak in opposition to this. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, John S. There, John. He was going to speak on open intoxicants. We'll hold that off in case he's around. Uh, Thomas Kane. Thank you, uh, Mayor and Aldermen. I'm Thomas Kane, 425 North Lapham. I'm on top of the hill right above the gate. That's one of my concerns. Uh, I've been in business, various businesses, for over 30 years. And I, I echo some of the thoughts as putting another gas station literally than one mile. You'll have four gas stations. We've heard tonight there'll be no increase in traffic. Where's the extra business gonna come from to support them? One of those stations will end up boarded up within a couple of years, and then what? We already lost a Clark station a couple years ago. That's an empty cement lot. It's an eyesore next to the strip mall, Great Clips to be specific. Uh, there, I have nothing against them coming to town. I'm sure they're a fine organization, but there's gotta be a better location for them to do business. And also it's bad faith for the owners of those other gas stations that have applied, gotten their permits, sell whatever they sell, and do, do good in the community, whether they're helping others support private programs, paying their taxes, and now they get this bad, bad deal of, good, of bad faith. As far as the bridge, it's a substandard bridge. It's a one-laid road that's in terrible repair. It's even hard to walk on. How are you gonna run traffic up and down that is beyond me. It's not set up and it's not structured to handle that level of traffic. If you run that through, remember there's a middle school at the end of North Lapham. You're gonna see a lot of traffic up and down that road for that entire school year. And the day is gonna come, somebody mentioned it, I see a, a semi-truck once a week come down there following his GPS only to find out it's gated. If that gate's open, how long before one of those goes over the bridge and collapses it? The bridge is not made for that kind of traffic. It's made many years ago for a single car. Uh, the other concerns are safety. There's a lot of children in the neighborhood. Someone else mentioned that. There are, there are a ton of little kids on bikes once a week I stop my car coming down Lapham because a kid's chasing a ball into the street, all right? Um, I don't see a good reason to put it there. It's fine if they wanna come to town, but I think they need to do a little more research and find a much better area where they can do better business and be a, more of an asset to the community than it would be at our location, so. 
Thank you. Yep. Mark, Mark Johnson. Mark Johnson, 545 North Lapham Street. I, you know, I basically live on the bridge on the first property north of the bridge. Um, traffic, when, when the traffic was open during construction of the Thrill Farm subdivision, it was horrendous. It was, it was terrible. You know, they, they came zooming through there, whatever, 30, 40 miles an hour. Uh, I can't imagine what a stop sign on either side is going to do. You know, stop, you know, you, where are you going to put it? Right in front of uh, Riverside Park? You have Erdman Park on the other side. Uh, the traffic condition there is just too great to handle anything like that. You know, Casey, welcome to the city. Hopefully they can find another location. Um, I don't think this is the place to go with them, and I strongly oppose opening that gate. Uh, another thought is Lapham Street in, this, in that <coughs> subdivision, is that built for that much traffic? that much extra traffic you know that should be considered and if you, you know a traffic study should include what I saw when the, when the gate was open and that's you know 14 years ago with less population and again you got the junior high north of there um, I hope that gate is never open thanks guys thank you uh, <coughs> Jim <laughs> Jim Morehouse Please speak in the microphone, get you on record. Okay. Jim Morehouse, 502 Thorough Drive. I could use uh, 10 minutes on three of the topics tonight that keep coming up, but I'm going to limit my uh, presentation to the condos that are being proposed on the hill. It's Pioneer Ridge condos. And I'm going to uh, give you a short summary of that. I will not spend a lot of time going into the details of how the roadway exit to that new condo went from 11 foot path to a 20 foot path to 24 wide street, not a road, to service those two new condos. Yes, we've always known that they would finish the last two buildings on the hill, so don't say that, well, you guys always knew that building was there. Yes. But we did not know that the city was going to run the road to service those condos right between two houses on that pathway that um, goes to the tower. That little 30-foot easement was planned for access to the tower. And then um, I'll try to avoid any personal preference or speculation and only talk about facts tonight. So quickly going through summary. The original plan for Pioneer Ridge condos, five buildings, was that they would have access from Lapham up to the hill. Then um, and the there was an indication that the easement path to the water tower um, would, would be a, intended as an entrance to the condo building four and five through lots number 32 and 33, right between them. So those houses now will have a street about 10 to 20 feet from their, the side of their house because that was just a thin path. And that's exhibit one that shows how the subdivision was laid out with that easement. And if it was a proper road to access those, then it would have been laid out like Golden View Court, and it'd be about 30 feet, and the houses would be set back. Um, then in September, the plan commission said there should be an emergency exit for that, and that's exhibit four. Um, so then in July, uh, residents of 16 residents came to a public meeting 
and on the proposed CUP to add 48 condos. And um, then the newspaper focus was here, and that was a big meeting, and um, it was reported in the paper that, and that article is attached for your use, that all the commissioners who spoke agreed that they will not approve the project if it includes an access road into the subdivision. And now there's talk that they're going to make a 24-foot road right through between those two houses. And my, my question to the county is, yeah, you would never approve a, a layout like that in a subdivision where you take a 30-foot grass strip and make a roadway to 32 units and the other condos can use that too. So my question is, why not stick with the original plan? The road going up from Lapham is still there. It's usable by the two existing buildings. Why not the original, use the original plan and make that road service the next two? Don't run that path. So th that's pretty much it. I had one other comment um, on, um, oh, um, for the Casey CUP, uh, real quickly, 30 seconds, item in the CUP that was presented the draft last time, there was a item 25 that said, um, transferable to anybody that ever, if Casey's didn't take that um, property or left that property, that that CUP would be transferable to anybody for any reason and um, would not be reviewed by the city or a public hearing. My question is, would that be, uh, could they build a gun shop there without any approval? Could they build a adult bookstore there. I don't know if there's other regulations, but that seems like a, a funny statement to put in there that um, there's no, no approval required if Casey leaves. It's just kind of a weird statement in there that that's, that CUP will serve anything and everything that's desired in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Michael Jar. Michael Jar, 271 Thoreau Drive. Uh, I want to start off by saying I'm delighted that um, Casey's is interested in Oconomowoc. I love to see people come in here and, and eager to do business in, the, in our town. It does strike me as an odd location um, and, and not ideal. And I am concerned th with the, uh, somebody else raised the point that with the competition of those four gas stations in such close proximity, should one of them go out of business, we have ourselves another brownfield that we can't develop, and I don't think that's a benefit at all to the community. Um, my bigger concern, or, or a, a, a equal concern, I guess, is uh, the, the idea of opening that bridge on Lapham. Um, we've got children that uh, access that bridge on bikes. We've got runners. We've got people who walk their dogs across that bridge. And I don't know if you've all seen that, that little strip, but there are no sidewalks there. There are no alternatives for people on foot. So if you've got cars coming northbound and southbound and maybe a couple of cars are lined up, do the kids on their bikes get in line with the cars? How do they get across that bridge with the, with the oncoming traffic going both ways? I don't see any safe way of doing that. I don't see any alternative for, for the runners, the walkers, the, the bikers, and the, and the um, dog walkers who, to get across that in a, in, a safe, um, in a safe way when there's traffic coming both sides. So appreciate your time. Thanks. Uh, John S. Is John around? Apparently John's not here. Is there any other comments that would be presented tonight? Hang on. Just give, state your name and address. Dean Natterstad, 444 North Lapham Street. Um, to me, uh, something struck me as the gentleman made the presentation about the needs assessment for the town and how, many, how much people appreciate the park and recreation. Uh, to me, that just dawned on me, you're going to open that baby up with that gate. And then I'm also the second house on, right on the knoll there, and my office is right along Lapham. 
and I see what many others see, those trucks come flying through, um, and then you've got two parks, Ording and what's the other one down there? Riverside. Riverside. A uh, lot of people, I walk through there many times, I'm affirming everything that everyone else has said about the amount of appreciation of the freedom to walk uh, through that whole, th those two park systems right there, you you open that baby up to a lot more traffic. The other thing of a uh, sidewalk and being able to get across uh, for our kids, just the bridge when other people are trying to. Uh, to me, the need assessment thing, that well done, uh, it's gonna impact, in my mind, the ability to enjoy those two parks down there, uh, Riverside and Ordy, uh, big time. Thank you for the Thanks. time. <laughs> Any other comments? You had your three minutes already. Okay. Ten seconds. Did I have to leave? Thousand one, there was a thousand two. comment about the intoxicants. Just um, <laughs> there was a community not far from us, and unfortunately, with my memory, I can't remember where it was. But they just voted this week to not allow what we're thinking about doing it, and the biggest reason was because of the police department. The police and the emergency services there thought it was going to be. It, they, they tried it, they did a test run on it, it was too taxing on the department, and based upon the police department's recommendation, they voted it down, and that just happened this week, and unfortunately, all I can tell you is the community started with an M. Senior citizens. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, any other comments? You, if you already spoke, I mean. No, no, I no. On the same item? Two stop signs on a bri uncontrolled bridge there. I don't even know if that's legal. I think it's something you got the engineers better check out. Yeah. Okay. okay. We're going to move on to regular business now. Um, <clears throat> next item, first of all, the first real item that we're going to work on is the consent agenda. Um, there's several items. I'm not going to list them all off, but we need a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Second. Any questions, concerns? Go ahead. Hey, I thought Kruger bought them. It's under licenses. Uh, licenses. Diane, I'm assuming no. that's how they applied it's main application as right. pick and yeah, save. It's still pick and save. Yeah. Yeah. Is this the, the question? That's okay. Yeah. The Kruger owns we take the, the parent company. We take the information right off their applications for renewal. Kruger's bought roundies. And roundies don't pick and save. Okay, any other questions? Seeing none, call the roll, please. Alderman Stray? Aye. Alderman Kavieski? Aye. Alderman Miller? Aye. Alderman Rosick? Aye. Alderman Shaw? Aye. Alderman Ellis? Aye. Alderman Zwart? Aye. Okay, committee reports. First one is Finance Committee. Con first item is Consider Act on Resolution Authorizing Funds. For facade improvement grant for 110 North Main Street. We need a motion to approve the resolution. So moved. Second. Bob. Thank you, Mayor and Alderman. Uh, this is to complete the uh, full restoration of the man block building at 110 North Main. If you recall, we approved 102, 108 North Main. A portion of this building was conduit off wanted to find an opportunity to be able to restore the rest of that building when the contractor is here doing the majority of it. It's obviously a cornerstone structure in downtown Oconomowoc. Uh, working with that owner, I uh, am trying to uh, obtain the council's approval for the CDA to approve a $15,000 facade grant. They would pursue a $25,000 Oconomowoc loan pool loan in which the owner would put out and then $20,000 in equity, so a total investment of $60,000 to complete that project. Thank you, Bob. Open up for discussion. Matt? I voted against the uh, the huge um, grant, but I am gonna vote in favor of this because I believe this is what the facade grants were for, was you know smaller kind of projects. Um, and then combined with the loan, it's a good deal, so. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Bob. Good, any other comments, concerns? We have a motion and a second on the floor, call the roll. Alderman Stray? Aye. Alderman Kavieski? Aye. Alderman Miller? Aye. Alderman Rosick? Aye. Alderman Shaw? Aye. Alderman Ellis? Aye. Alderman Zwart? Aye. Thank you. Okay, moving on to protection and welfare. The first item is consider acting an ordinance to create section 12.05 of the municipal code 
Regulating public possession of open intoxicants. This is for the first reading of the ordinance. So moved. Second. Is it second or John? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, before you this evening is a draft, a first draft and first reading of the ordinance of um, public possession of open intoxicants. Uh, dating back to earlier this year, there was a request by the council members to consider drafting this ordinance uh, specifically for special event use in the downtown area. So on May 15th, the original draft was submitted to the Common Council, and we're bringing it back one more time for uh, considered consideration and review. So the first thing at the bottom of the memo identifies a, a yellow area. I'm sorry, I don't have a slide for everyone this evening, but there's a, a map that identifies the area for the public possession and open intoxicants. That's with all the aldermen. The ordinance itself, in essence, will allow if for special events through the special event process that goes through the Park and Recreation and Forestry Department with input from the Police Department as well as Public Works in terms of criteria required for special events would allow um, those special events to have public possession open intoxicants in the area that's identified on the map. For, so in essence it would go from the Village Green, it would include the boat launch area and the downtown area in West Wisconsin Avenue and a little bit of Main Street and all the way up to the roundabout for general purposes for everyone that is here. Uh, in the committee there was a significant amount of discussion about it and there are some recommendations to amend this ordinance prior to the second reading. Those three things included making sure the title is changed to include the language for special event. Uh, we wanted to create an exception option for special events that alcohol would not be part of the process. An example of that would be the high school parade. Uh, and then we wanted to make sure there was a defined time frame of when these events are taking place and how this pu public possession open intoxicants would actually be applied. So those would be additions that would come back at the second reading. Thank okay, you, Mayor. Thanks. Open it up for discussion. Seeing none, uh, we have a motion and second on the floor. Call the roll, please. Hmm. Alderman Stray? Aye. Alderman Kavieski? Aye. Alderman Miller? Aye. Alderman Rosick? Aye. Alderman Shaw? Aye. Alderman Ellis? Aye. Alderman Swart? Aye. Next is uh, consider act of the ordinance amending section 21.03 of the municipal code regarding public entertainment restricted. This would be its first reading. So moved. Second. John? Thank you. Our current ordinance for public entertainment and restricted uh, did not encompass the true areas that are being used in the community for public events and special events. So uh, public entertainment area with the addition of the following language would include Roosevelt Field, City Beach, Fowler Park, and now the Village Green as well. Uh, public entertainment does require a permit from the Park and Recreation Department, which is the special event process. Comments, questions? Seeing none, uh, we have a motion and a second. Call the roll, please. Alderman Stray? Aye. Alderman Kavieski? Aye. Alderman Miller? Alderman Rosick? Aye. Alderman Shaw? Aye. Alderman Ellis? Aye. Alderman Zwart? Aye. Okay, moving along. Consider Act on Ordinance Amending Section 21.051 of the Municipal Code regarding Fowler Lake Boardwalk, Pier, and Gazebo Use Control. This would be for its first reading. So moved. Second. John. Thank you. Again, this is a housekeeping item. Uh, prior to the recent redevelopment or reconstruction of the parking lot in the, in the boardwalk area, uh, a gazebo was part of that past um, existing structure. So in essence of cleaning it up for housekeeping, we, re we have removed the word gazebo throughout the ordinance, and then we've added some additional language in two areas. Uh, one, one area is item J, which is on, at the end of the, or on the bottom of the second page. And this particular area talks about no person shall moor a boat on the boardwalk or the pier. And mooring would be for an extended duration of time. Boats may be moored to the pier at Fowler Lake Boat Launch, which now has a new pier there in the last year, for up to three hours for transient purposes. So if somebody was on the lake, wanted to come in and park their boat, go grab something to eat downtown and come back and leave, they would have a three-hour period to do that. So it's not permanent mooring, it's temporary mooring or transient boat mooring. The second edition, uh, letter K, indicates amplified music is prohibited on the boardwalk and pier unless a permit, a permit is obtained. Uh, what we're trying to prevent there is a vehicle, for example, pulling up, backing up to the boardwalk, 
I shouldn't say kids, it could be anybody, hanging out and jacking up the music out of the back of their car, which could be a public nuisance. So we're trying to narrow the scope and allow our police department an opportunity for enforcement. Thank you, John. Questions, comments? Seeing none, we have a motion and second on the floor. Call the roll. Alderman Stray. Aye. Alderman Kavieski. Aye. Alderman Miller. Aye. Alderman Rosick. Aye. Alderman Shaw. Aye. Alderman Ellis. Aye. Alderman Swart. Aye. Okay, consider act on ordinance amending section 21.09 of the municipal code regarding dogs and parks prohibited. This is for its first reading. Get a motion to uh, so move. Give the ordinance second. first reading. First and second, go ahead, John. Thank you. Uh, unlike the previous uh, ordinance request, this is not a housekeeping item. This is a new item. Uh, for those who are not familiar with our current ordinances, uh, at this time, dogs are not allowed in our public park system. Uh, other than a permitted dog walking area, which is located just off the Lake Country Trail across from Imagination Station back by our wastewater treatment plant. It's a park that is not used very often. It's not a true dog park with fencing and, and management, but it is a space that people can go. But other than that, dogs are not allowed in the park. So our office over the last several years has received uh, a, ver a, a significant number of phone calls, significant to me is 15 to 20, which is a lot on any topic for our, our department, to consider changing our ordinance to allow dogs in our parks uh, from dog owners. So we've drafted for consideration a new ordinance for, for the Park and Recreation Board. They reviewed the ordinance, uh, approved the ordinance, voting five to one to bring it to the Common Council for consideration. So the new ordinance reflects the following changes. Uh, dogs and parks, publicly owned right of way, city owned land and parking lots is prohibited, is the title. The change is a person who owns, harbors, or keeps a dog may bring it into a city owned park, publicly owned right of way, city owned land or parking lot if the dog is on leash and is on a paved pathway, sidewalk, or boardwalk. Item two, there was a minor uh, housekeeping item. Uh, we referred to the, this, prohib this prohibition shall not apply to registered uh, seeing eye dogs. We changed that to say service dogs when accompanied by the owner. So service dogs are allowed in our park system at this time. That's a, that's a text change. Uh, number three, there are no changes. And number four was the addition of dogs are prohibited at City Beach within the fenced area of Imagination Station at Roosevelt Park, children's play areas, athletic fields, tennis courts, park shelters, restrooms, Veterans Memorial Park, which was an amendment through the committee, or other designated and signed locations. So the intent of that item was to basically s clarify pathways and sidewalks and the boardwalk. So somebody was walking a dog in a public park with the new ordinance and they walked up the sidewalk then had a, a branch off of it that went 20 feet and then into the tennis court and technically that's still paved. But that's not an area that we want dogs to be in. So the, the intent from the Park and Recreation Board was to allow dogs on leash on sidewalks, pathways, or the boardwalk only with those exceptions listed earlier. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. <coughs> Let's open it up for discussion. Matt? Yeah, Jen, I, I do have some concerns changing this. Um, what it, how do we address dogs on piers? Are we going to allow dogs on piers? We have all these new piers in downtown here. Are we going to allow dogs to be on piers, to jump off of piers and do all that kind of jazz? That's something I have to look in. It's not specific in this part of the ordinance. Um, my concern is um, opening it, the parks up. I mean, parks are first supposed to be for people. Um, one of my comments in the committee was, why have we not considered a dog park? I think that actually some people commented that that would be a good idea. I, I personally think that's the better idea, um, have a designated dog park instead of opening the parks up to everyone. Um, I appreciate that we added Veterans Memorial Park, but our committee did not vote in favor of this and send this on. Obviously, it's still on in front of the council, and we can still vote on it. Um, but I think we're, I, I, I guess, you give an inch, sometimes people take a mile. People are already violating that rule, and they're bringing the dogs in the parks anyway. And once we take the signs down and let them bring them in the park, um, they're they're not going to just keep them on the pass. It's just I, I don't. It's not going to happen. Uh, people are going to walk their dogs in, and they're going to walk everywhere, and they're going to let them loose. And um, I think some of the comments from some of the folks about Nature Hill is exactly right. We've gone to Nature Hill 
dozens of times with our kids and dogs are running free there. And um, I think that could happen again and I, I don't think that's what our city parks are meant for. So I'll be voting Hello? against this. Hello? Um, this is something that we, we've had discussion on uh, for some time. I'm actually very much in favor of this. Um, I, I like the way it, it's structured. Um, I know that there are, are some who, who aren't in favor of it for the, the reasons that were presented. However, I have had uh, a lot of discussion with people in my, in my district, in my neighborhood, and an overwhelming majority of them uh, were in favor of it. Um, to the concerns associated with uh, the allowing dogs on the piers, I believe um, what this specifically states is paved areas within it, the park? It's paved pathways, sidewalks, or the boardwalk because that clearly is heavily traveled right now. All of which would exclude the pier in, in my opinion, but to your point, you know, if, if it um, specifically called out piers, I don't know if they would abide by it or, or, or not, but to me the, the language would exclude um, piers. Um, I believe in, in passing this type of, uh, of, of ordinance, uh, the city support associated with that. Um, there was some discussion about um, waste. We don't. We currently don't have waste stations, but there are <coughs> a couple of locations around Fowler Park that um, there are, are waste bags associated with that. And I believe in our discussion, if this were to pass um, council, there would be waste stations associated with uh, specific areas that um, maybe heavily used uh, to help um, accommodate for waste disposal. Is that a fair statement? Uh, that clearly could be implemented. It would be a budgetary item. Um, if we felt this ordinance was appropriate and we wanted to move forward, uh, that could be a component and be considered in the operating budget of 2019. Okay. Well, um, not quite. Almost. Um, while I, I, I think a, a dog park would be a, a nice addition um, from from exercising the, the animal standpoint. I think there are a lot of residents within our city that, that take their dog on the walk with them so they get exercise along with their pet. Um, this will help that part of, of, of their walking routine um, to be in compliance. I think those who are currently taking their dog on leash or off leash in those areas are, are clearly violating our, our, our ordinance that's currently in place. Um, I think this allows for accommodation and definition for where those pets would be allowed. Uh, the only thing that I, I think would be um, a, an, an added benefit to this, while they're on leash, um, I think everybody has seen the retractable uh, leashes that could be 15, 20 feet long um, to have some type of uh, four or six or some type of controlled uh, measurement uh, <coughs> associated with that would be beneficial. Throw it in your ordinance. We don't need this unless it's a pit bull. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, that's true. That's true. With or without a muzzle. Exactly. Tom, you had a comment? Oh, I did. I certainly did. And now I forgot what it was. Um, I, 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 I agree with Matt, and I agree with Lou. Uh, the uh, dogs are going to have a hard time jumping from maybe a concrete onto a bridge and onto the pier. Um, I thank the committee for uh, just allowing any of the uh, uh, dogs in Veterans Park because we spent a lot of money on that park. And I've already seen some yellow stuff on one of my bricks in there. So I'm hoping that that all gets taken care of. So I, I, I think that a dog park is the right way to go. A nice big one. We got all kinds of, or that's make some different parks that we have. How many parks do we have here, John? 50, 48 parks or something? Uh, we have that many properties. I would say 38 active parks. 38, uh, yeah. I think we can designate those two to do that, so. Yeah, that'd be good. Well, if, you, if you're going to have a uh, off-leash park, you have to fence it in. Yes. Yeah. yes. So you're going to have to fence in a 20-acre park. Mm -hmm. No, it doesn't have to be 20 acres. Oh. I mean, we'll, get the the we'll get the money from Bill. Yeah. yeah there you go. Derek? 
Uh, question for John, would this include any trails too as part of a park system? No. Um, if we have some new trails, would that be included as part of the walking area as long as it was paved? Well, the, way, the way the ordinance was drafted would be paved sidewalks or the boardwalks were hard surface trails. So I think you're referring to grass or a mulch type trail. No, I'm talking about like if we do something along Rosenau Creek or whatever. Would well, that, that They would be able to walk on a paved trail. But they wouldn't without this then, correct? That is correct. All right. Well, I guess I'm a little bit torn, but uh, I'd like to let people walk their dogs, and I'd like the responsible people not to be punished and encourage them to call out people that are doing things wrong. Um, it's kind of like the beer garden thing. Don't do something, you know, people will abuse it, but if, if you want to keep it, you gotta you got to abide within the rules. So I'm going to vote for this, basically just not to be... Uh, to let people walk their dogs along the boardwalks and through our parks and stay on the paved trails. And if they don't, I would, I would hope if they, if the people doing it, um, I'm repeating myself, but I'm, I would hope that if the people that wanted this and wanted to abide by it would, would say something to the people that are not, that are already out there not doing things properly. Really? Yeah, Derek, I agree with you entirely. Um, people are doing this already. They're walking their dogs. Um, Chief, you find this enforceable, you'll be able to enforce what this ordinance then? Yeah, we'll be able to enforce that. Uh, 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 anything is going to simplify it for us. We have people in there with dogs on a leash. We know they're abiding by it. People out their dogs, just letting their dogs run around at large or in the grass. That's a different situation. So it, it's, there's going to be an educational period. There always is. But then we'll do like we do now. We warn people once if we have contact with them again, you know, they typically get issued a citation. Okay. And you have that same issue with dog bites. The lady asked earlier about what happens Correct. with dog bites, and the right. police are well aware of what they should be doing with yes. that. Yes. Okay. And then at the Mor Memorial Day festivities this year, there were dogs on the city beach grass areas and stuff like that and there were some problems because of that so to be able to tell people you can have the dog there but it's got to be up on the sidewalk would be a lot better than having it out on the grass so I am going to be in support of this. Part of the problem not part of the problem but with this ordinance it's usually complaint driven unless one of our officers happen across a dog but we see the majority of dogs and people walking through the village green on the sidewalk so this will give us that ability. And Matt, to address your issue with dogs jumping off of the pier, once they're off leash, they're considered a dog at large, and we address that differently. Okay, Mike? Um, I'm, I'm not in favor of this at all. I don't like, um, like some of the c other comments were made, um, I want to be able to go to the beach, sit down at the beach, I don't want a dog coming by there, sniffing me, sniffing my kids, my mm -hmm. grandchildren, whatever. I don't want to see a dog drop trawl two feet away and then have to pick it up while I'm eating lunch. Um, it's nice to have the city beach, I think, um, prestige without any dogs around it. The like, dogs can walk on the sidewalk. The dogs can walk all around the block. There's no reason for them to be on the beach or any of the parks. I thought the city beach was... It's uh, prohibited. prohibited. That, that yeah. park's prohibited. Well, yeah, right. But I mean, so I did, there's no reason for them to be down there. Oh, that was one my comment there, but you know there is a ninety-nine dollar fine for dogs in the park after one warning, and it goes up and up and up from there. So uh, hopefully, you know the chief uh, will take care of that. So. Right. Um, yeah, the, Mike's Mike's comment. He said it to me off the record here too on the side too. Is we're we're adding sidewalk, but dogs can already walk on sidewalks in the community with their owners right this is referring to sidewalks within the parks okay what are do we have parks that have con contain sidewalks throughout the entire park <laughs> we have some parks that do not have sidewalks at all hmm. our some of our neighborhood parks and what that I'm thinking about like even Fowler there's not really a pa is there there's a little paved path to the pier I think well it's the road that goes they would the walk road. the arc the road yeah, and then the road. there's a path it goes it does go yeah. towards the pier the or the uh, Girl Scout well, house what, what I'd like to do is make one little amendment then um, I, I think we should try to keep the dogs off all the new piers that we're putting in as well um, so I think we should add in and I'll make the amendment that we add in to section 4 right where we talked about Veterans Memorial Park to include um, keeping dogs off the piers as well so uh, public piers public pier right of course public piers I'll make that amendment to section 4 we have a second 
Hold on, you want to second that, and I want to discuss it. Okay, <coughs> there's a motion and a second to amend it to keep dogs off of piers. Go ahead. When somebody's launching their boat and they want to get their dog in their boat, I guess they might need to use the pier to do that. That's the only thing. And there's, hap there's people yeah. who take their dogs out on their boat. So I don't want somebody to get a ticket because they're launching their boat and they're bringing their dog out there. Well, throw them in the back of the boat before they throw it in the water. Maybe you can drive it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess I didn't think maybe about maybe that. Maybe you can water ski. It doesn't work. Kevin? Yeah, I think that's kind of an overkill because the same thing. I mean, you, did, you got a gentleman or they're going to uh, launch their boat. But what are they going to do? Are they going to leave the dog in their car? Really? Well, there's a motion out there, a motion in a second, so we have to vote on the amendment. Any other discussion on the amendment? Go ahead, Chairman. Yeah, I've launched my boat at LaBelle and had the dog with me, and I can't leave the dog in the boat while I go park no. car and trailer, so I'm <laughs> going to have to walk the dog with me out on the pier. Really, you could swim that. out with the dog. Exactly. So you're supposed to I have it trained. <laughs> you guys are acting like this is impossible. No, and I understand what you're saying. I just don't think. I, it's I, you know, my, I guess my, my my goal with it was to keep the dogs off of the piers, running off the piers, jumping off the piers while you're out there fishing with your kids or whatever, and you know it's not going to happen. So okay. um, I'll withdraw the motion to amend. Second. With, you'll withdraw the second. Who had the second? Derek. Second. Is that how I do that? Yeah. Yeah. Withdraw the second. <laughs> Okay, so the amendment first, and then you can withdraw yours. Yeah. Okay. The amendment's off the table now. Now, so we're back to the original. Yeah. Any other comments? Seeing none, we have a motion and a second on the uh, original ordinance. Call the roll, please. Alderman Stray. Mm, uh, nay. Alderman Kavieski. Aye. Alderman Miller. Nay. Alderman Rosick. Nay. Alderman Shaw. Aye. Alderman Ellis. Aye. Alderman Zwart. Aye. That's four four. Okay. It passed. That's the first reading. We do have to have a second reading. Uh, next item is, well, I'll take the next two items. To, we'll, we'll discuss the next two items together, but there are two separate um, resolutions. First is consider acting resolution granting renewal of 2018-2019 alcohol and beverage license, licenses. And the second one is the resolution expressing intent not to renew. And those are, and Diane will explain that. But let's go with the first one of uh, resolution granting renewal of 2018-2019 licenses. So moved. Second. Okay. Diane, do you want to address that? Yes. Um, the resolution lists all the um, licensees that have applied for renewal. Um, they already have a license, so these are all renewals. Um, they meet all Chapter 12 licensing requirements and laws, so therefore um, I recommend that Council adopt the resolution so we can, at which grants the licenses for each of these licensees. Okay, so that's for the resolution, the grant. Go ahead. Yeah, one of the questions I had during committee was this Magna LLC. This is the group that came in with the liquor purchases and whatnot to keep their liquor licenses there in the old, what is it, the old tennis, indoor tennis facility yep. behind Olympia there. Um, have we checked on these guys whether they're compliant with all fire codes and building codes? Yep. Yes, they all have licensees to have to be inspected by police, building inspector, and fire. Okay, so that's I part guess, of our code. Right, so my question maybe was <laughs> has that been done for them since yes. they came in last year and pulled the wool over our eyes? Yes, that has been done, and all the, the three departments that inspected signed off on the inspection sheet as approving. Uh, their inspection. Do we check that they are in compliance with the other portions of the ordinance, which is that they're a continuous business? I mean, are they actually selling liquor or are they just faking it? Our code does not specify days or hours of operation. Um, and if they use it one time a year and they can prove that they, which they have, purchased their alcohol from a wholesaler, they're meeting the codes. Well, except that our code right now says 90 days if they haven't been in business. So do we know, do we check that every 90 days they're in business? No. Okay. No. Is there, is there a method for us, potentially in the future, for businesses like this that are just attempting to keep the licenses for, just for their own resale purposes at some point, future point, whenever that may come in a decade or two, um, that we can check that they're actually operating? I mean, we know Crafty Cow's operating because they're open right now. I can look across the street and there's people in there drinking a beer. 
Um, are we, do we periodically just drive by or have someone look in the window? I mean, I can do it. I'm happy to. Um, I drive we by can't and look. treat any licensed establishment different from the others. So I I would believe, and of course our attorney would have to really weigh in. But if you're going to check on one, you need to check on them all. So you'd have to stop at every one. Yeah, but am I official enough for the city to say it hasn't been operating for 90 days? I go on there 90 days in a row and it's not open. You'd have to be there during all hours of operation. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's very difficult. Yeah, my wife won't like that. I'll help you, Matt. <laughs> I'll help you. I'd say every alderman take a turn. You know, you go. Like, no, not You've got the 8 to 10 shift. You've got the <laughs> whatever. I'll take two turns. Is there, so I guess, <laughs> I, I guess then, the, then my questions lead into another thing, which is what, what can we do to amend or work on our ordinances and maybe it's a, an action item for us at, while we're doing our strategic planning process to figure out what we do to look into these type of businesses that we know are just holding the licenses. Maybe they're opening one day every 90 days. You know, what can we do? Do, they, do we have to mandate hours of operation potentially? No, yeah. you can't actually. We can't. Uh, we can't. Under chapter so we can't, we can't mandate op we hours can't, of operation. But okay. I'll talk to you offline. Yeah, well, okay. <laughs> if the, they might not be open when we get done with this meeting tonight. <laughs> Charlie? Hold me adjourned. Matt, I have stopped there. <laughs> There's a motion. It's Second. <laughs> Good deal, yeah. I have stopped there to see if they've been open at least a dozen times, and I've yet to find it open. Oh, thank you. Okay, any other comments? We have a motion and a second on the floor. This is for the renewals. Um, call the roll, please. Alderman Stray? Aye. Alderman Kavieski? Aye. Alderman Miller? Aye. Alderman Rosick? Aye. Alderman Shaw? Aye. Alderman Ellis? Aye. Alderman Zwart? Aye. The next item is uh, consider acting resolution expressing intent not to renew the 2018-19-2019 alcohol and beverage licenses <coughs> and direct city clerk to send notice of intent to each licensee and set hearing date. We need a motion for the resolution. So moved. Second. And th this regards, what do we have, one or two? Two. Two. And we have three. And, and the one license for Olympia, they have received a letter of intent to um, reopen. So there's an investor in interested. So um, just to take that under consideration, there still are issues with that facility, though. So, and Diane will explain that. Right. Thank you, Mayor. Um, there are two licensees on this resolution, and what this means is that as of 5 p.m. today, they are not fully compliant with all city codes, um, our liquor licensing chapter. So they've been notified, but this resolution now allows um, me to give them formal notice that the council will have a hearing on the, um, their license, whether or not to renew, renew that license. So we're looking at a hearing date of June 19th at 7.30 p.m. Um, we have to send the a complaint and a notice and it has to be delivered to the licensees. They, in the meantime, Absolutely. could comply before June 19th and if they do, then at that meeting, I would bring forth a resolution to grant their license once they're in, if they're all in compliance. If they're not in compliance by June 19th, then they have the opportunity to speak to you about any of the codes that they do not comply with and either how they're going to um, correct that or if they can't correct it. And then it's, of course, going to be up to council what to do. Okay, Ma Matt? Yeah, Mayor, am I allowed to separate these two out, take two separate votes on these? Yeah, it's called a motion to separate it. I'll mo move to separate the Olympia Resort, um, the exemption license from this resolution and create a separate resolution for it. Second. Second. Discussion. Charlie. Why? I, I just think we should talk about these two things separately. I think they're separate issues. Um, they're both non-compliant for different issues, and I think we should talk about them separately. Olympia's got some other issues going on that I think we should talk about, and uh, Sobies. I, I think we should talk about Sobies too because they're. It's not their fault. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, right. and I think we should talk about it separately because I do think they're separate issues with regard to the revocation. Well, if I could possibly weigh in, just so we're clear and we understand what's going on here. They both have one issue in that, there's been some comments, that is they are not compliant with
with our fire code. Not Sobeys. Sobeys is unpaid Sobeys. taxes. Um, is the only issue with Olympia that they've been closed for more than 90 days? Or no. are there other code issues? Uh, code, fire uh, issues. Our, our code mandates that we can't reopen the event unless they are compliant with all code requirements, separate and apart from the closure thing. All you would be doing is allowing them to try to get compliant by the time we uh, get to the approval on June 19th so they can come in and then talk about the other issue that I think you're concerned about that if they present a good enough argument. No, it's a different no. place. Olympia? Uh, yeah, Olympia. Yeah, it's not, that's not Orco. Mm -hmm. You're talking about the... He wants to... Not yeah, I want to talk about both of them separately because they're separate issues for reservation. Oh, you want to talk about Sobeys and, uh, and the Olympia Resort. Yeah. Look, I just want to split them out and I want a separate vote in each one. I have a motion and you yeah. know, I gave my reasoning. Right, so so. Yeah. We have a motion, so we will take Sobeys up first. Well, I didn't, oh, no, I didn't do roll call on that. Mayor. Roll call on the okay, motion. Okay. I'm not trying to make the meeting go longer. Yes, you are. <laughs> you are. <laughs> we have a motion to separate. Do we have any discussion? Can you discuss that? Yeah. Okay. It, it can. Yeah. Oh, can I make it? I, I just want to find out, you know, to for people so it doesn't get around town about the, the one instance, the, the Sobeys, you know, to explain kind of what the problem is with that. Or that's what I that or not? That's part that's of the goal of the yeah. separation, so we can talk about that. Good. Okay. Any other questions? So, no other questions. We have a motion and a second to separate. Mm -hmm. All the roll votes. Alderman Stray. Aye. Alderman Kavieski. Aye. Alderman Miller. Aye. Alderman Rosick. Aye. Alderman Shaw. Nay. Alderman Ellis. Nay. Alderman Zwart. Aye. Okay. <coughs> now the two two uh, establishments are separated, so we'll take up Sobeys first. Mm -hmm. Is that the on the list? Um. Yes. So. It's so. I guess <coughs> Diane can explain the reasoning why that one is being on the not to renew list. Yes. Okay. So our code states that if there are any claims owed to the city by a licensee or premises that um, it's cause for non-renewal or revocation, the premises owes taxes, property taxes. So the licensee, Sobeys, does not own the building but their address of the premises, the delinquent taxes comes up. So um, we've notified the owner of the building and of course we've notified Sobeys. And I, you know, I don't know what resolution, if any, will occur, but that would be something to take up at the hearing. Um, but we, it's coming up under the premises and that's what our code states. Yeah, and that's what I wanted to say uh, with regard to Sobe specifically was it's not Sobe's restaurant that's not paying something or delinquent, it's the building owner. Right? Correct. So we're trying to get the building owner to comply by basically taking away their you know, liquor license from the person who's renting and paying them money. So it's not Sobe's fault. So. Correct. So be it. Yeah. Oh. Any other? Oh. So, <laughs> so we're going to split it again? No. <laughs> <laughs> that works so good. So the question here is, um, they're both resolutions to deny. Right. Mm -hmm. So an I vote. No, it's no, no a not a to motion deny. to give no, her no. the authority to send them a notice so they have to come in on the 19th to explain why, why they <laughs> should not be denied. Right. <clears throat> Intent to deny, yeah. Right. Right. So an I vote would be? So she can send notice. Right? So she can send I notice. I can send that, right. right. And and scheduled a hearing. But they... So Sobeys can still serve uh, up until the time that it's Up until the 30th. 30th. Up yep. until the 30th, mm -hmm. and hopefully they'll get the property owner to pay the taxes. Correct. That's Unless correct. we figure out something by then. Right. There's not much you can do. I mean, it's an ordinance. We can't change the ordinance? Not that fast. Ms. Any Trudy? other discussion? And if there, yeah, okay. There's no other discussion. Call the roll, please. Okay. Alderman Stray. Aye. Alderman Kavieski. Aye. Alderman Miller. Aye. Alderman Rosick. Nay. Alderman Shaw. Aye. Alderman Ellis. Aye. Alderman Swart. Aye. <coughs> okay, the next item we'll take up is Olympia. Andy can mm -hmm. explain the 
Okay. Susan's there. Olympia um, it has closed, and it's been closed for more than 90 days, and that is one of our code items that if the business ceases for 90 or more days, consecutive days, that um, council could rev uh, revoke the license or not renew. Um, that is one issue. Another issue is they had their fire inspection, building, and police. Um, the building passed, police passed, but fire inspection has a list of um, various items, qu quite, quite a few items that need to be addressed before they could open their doors and operate. Um, they did have delinquent claims to the city, but came into the city, I think it was yesterday, sometimes it feels like maybe it was today, but it was yesterday, and they paid their claims. So that part is no longer an, a factor, it, the, the, but the factors are um, the cessation of business and the denial for the inspection. And those are the things council would be reviewing at the hearing. Did they have another claim um, for, for liquor? Thank you, yes. They did have a, a, also a delinquent claim to a, ve a liquor vendor, but that has also been paid. Okay, so they're paid up on all their fines. Um, <clears throat> one thing unique about Olympia is they have an exception license because they have the uh, the 300 seat capacity. They do not have a regular license. This license, <clears throat> if it was revoked, does not go back into our pool. It's not something anybody else can use. <clears throat> if we do not renew their license for some reason, then they have to reapply and pay the $10,000 reserve fee. Right now they don't have to do that with the license that they have. <clears throat> so there's some situations, some information, you know, things there that hopefully they'll get their is issues resolved or we'll set it up in a way that they can resolve their issues. If they are getting with the letter of intent and to reopen, it's something we may have to work. So just to bring that point up. Eric? I was going to bring that up, but I, okay. I think they should, we should still give them a notice, though. Well, they have to have the notice. That's got to be done. Right. So, and hopefully in two weeks they'll have everything resolved. Yeah, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to vote to revoke. Um, I am going to vote to send out the notice to revoke here because I have voted in the past for people that have ceased, stopped doing business, and I, I've stayed consistent with that for a while. Um, if you stop doing business and you just hang, you know, hang it up and then think you can keep the liquor license forever, I don't think that's an appropriate thing, even though it doesn't go back in the pool. doesn't go back to us. We don't get it back. Yeah, so. it's still one of those things where I think you, you need to kind of figure out how to get back in business or, or not. So I, I do think there's some other concerns, and hopefully that the folks will raise them on June 19th with us. Any other comments? Seeing none, uh, we have a motion second on the floor. Call the roll. Alderman Stray. Aye. <coughs> Alderman Kavieski. Aye. Alderman Miller. Aye. Alderman Rosick. Aye. Alderman Shaw. Aye. Alderman Ellis. Aye. Alderman Zwart. Aye. Without objection, I'd like to move the new business up ahead now. I'm, uh, just to, uh, we have some items out here, developers agreements and uh, another resolution of necessity revoking. And the planning commission items are gonna take some time, I think, so I'd like to get that done so that we don't have to have anybody here that's waiting for those two, three specific developers agreements to have to, to, to wait around. And then we'll get to the utility committee right after we get done with new business. Without objection, can we move that to the front? So under new business, we have uh, first item is consider acting res on rescinding motion of and vote adopting resolution of necessity uh, 18 uh, R 2734 for 336 West Wisconsin Avenue. So we need a motion to rescind the motion. Motion made. Second. Second. Are you going to explain it? Uh, why don't I just take yeah. that? Stand you know, um, yeah, you folks, we were given information that the property owners may be interested in uh, looking for the city to acquire this property. It's next to our launch down there. Might give us some opportunities. Um, as I always advise, we adopt the resolution of necessity to start the ball rolling, only to find out uh, very recently that there's absolutely no interest whatsoever. Uh, it was the considered opinion of staff that this body would not want to go forward and actually acquire it through eminent domain. And so in fairness to the property owner, you don't want to have this resolution necessity hanging over your head like there might be some condemnation proceedings at some point in time and in the past when we've done that we recommend that we rescind that and just clear the title out that's why we're here 
question? Sir? We didn't order an appraisal on that, did we? Anything? No, we caught it in time. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> questions? <coughs> Seeing none, call the roll, please. Alderman Stray? Aye. Alderman Kavieski? Aye. Alderman Miller? Aye. Alderman Rosick? Aye. Alderman Shaw? Aye. Alderman Ellis? Aye. Alderman Zwart? Aye. Okay, next we have three developer's agreements. Uh, the first one is uh, developer's agreement for Silver Lake Trails Phase 2. We need a motion to approve the developer's agreement. So moved. Second. Mark, you're going to explain this? Yes. Uh, thank you, Mayor. The uh, First item, the uh, first of the three developers agreements are uh, is Silver Lake Trails. This is the second phase of their development. Uh, this one includes 21 lots of the uh, total 58 out there. It's our standard template. We did have a couple changes due to some legislative changes, very, very minor wording, having dealing with the issue of building permits that's been incorporated into the document. Thank you. Standard or anything significant about the changes? Not particularly. We're still covered 100%. Um, it, it, these uh, developers got together and beat up on the legislature and, uh, yeah, oh yeah, oh, don't Just shave your head. And created some, um, some interesting new developments. Um, primarily, the, the biggest one would be that uh, they can get their building permits uh, after the binder courses are on. We can't hold them off until they get the, uh, up, you know, the top lift after that year. But uh, the bottom line is they can't uh, get a building permit until they have all the utilities that can serve them. And um, it's, uh, it's kind of common sense legislation. Um, and, and so we took that into account. And across the board, my firm and all 50 municipalities have sorted that out. And we've got a new template. And it, they're just minor changes. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Seeing none, we have a motion and a second on the floor. Call the roll, please. Alderman Stray? Aye. Alderman, Aye. Alderman Kavieski? Aye. Alderman Miller? Aye. Alderman Rosick? Aye. Alderman Shaw? Aye. Alderman Ellis? Aye. Alderman Zwart? Aye. Okay, next is a, a consider act on developer's agreement for Prairie Creek Ridge Edition 4. We need a motion for its approval. So yeah. moved. Second. Yeah. Uh, for an additional 20 lots on to what will be a total of 222 in that development. Uh, we haven't had any issues uh, with the other phases of the development, so we're recommending approval. Questions? Hey, I got a question, Mark. You know, um, along Z there, where their property is, it's blacktop. Is that just temporary sidewalks? No, that's meant to be a multi-use path that they've installed. So I can put my four-wheeler on it? Pardon? I can put my four-wheeler on it? No. You walk your dog on it. <laughs> I don't have a dog and I don't have a four wheeler, so here we go. So, all right. Good though. You Thank take you. your horse on it. Hey, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got hit by a fall ball today. Any other comments? I'm hard enough. Ouch. Seeing none, we have a motion and second on the floor. Call the roll. Alderman Stray. Aye. Alderman Kavieski. Aye. Alderman Miller. Aye. Alderman Rosick. Aye. Alderman Shaw. Aye. Alderman Ellis. Aye. Alderman Zwart. Aye. Uh, the last one is consider act on developer's agreement for Lake Country Village Edition 1. This is in the Village of Summit. Uh, we need a motion to approve it uh, to, for approval. Second. This is, uh, it'll be a total once it's built out, 305 lot subdivision. Uh, the application tonight is for 53 lots. There's already been 67 done in phase one. As noted, it is in the Village of Summit. Uh, we do have a developer's agreement because the Sanitary sewer and water main that are going into this development are city owned, and for that reason, we need to have the development agreement. Any questions? Matt. I, I see the developers are here. Mm -hmm. When are you guys going to fix our path out there? <laughs> Just kidding. And while you're at it, when are we getting our as built? <laughs> okay. All right. Soon. No, the, the every the, the actually the the development out there behind us is um, is going pretty well so far. I think it's a, the other side's a parade of home site. It's looking great over there. So nice houses. Okay. Any other questions? Seeing none. Uh, we have a motion and a second on the floor. Call the roll. Alderman Stray. E. Alderman Kavieski. Aye. Alderman Miller. Aye. Alderman Rosick. Aye. Alderman Shaw. Aye. Alderman Ellis. Aye. Alderman Swart. Aye. Uh, moving back up to uh, uh, committee reports, utility committee. Tonight we have um, com uh, consider active resolution for the Wisconsin DNR compliance 
maintenance annual report, the CMAR report for 2017. We need a motion to approve the resolution. So moved. Second. Kevin? Basically, the uh, report card for the wastewater treatment plant that's required by the state uh, for you guys to review every year. If you go to the last two pages, it basically tells you that uh, we scored A's on all the different topics that uh, are part of the compliance maintenance annual report. But I understand from Tom that it's been eight years straight. So it's just a, a way for you guys to take and know how the wastewater treatment plant's doing every year. And uh, we need a resolution for you guys to approve it so that we can have the uh, put it together with the state uh, submission. Thank you. This looks like uh, Alderman Stray's report card. Oh, you sure? Oh, I thought, geez, I thought you said F's. <laughs> jeez. Got all A's. Oh, good. Thank yeah, you. What kind of vote do you need from him anyway? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. Alderman Ellis? No? Do you have any questions or concerns? Uh, Alderman Shaw? No, I just have a comment. We talked a lot about this at the committee level and just want, we take it for granted that the wastewater treatment plant yeah. works great and this just shows that they do a really good job out there. So make sure you congratulate all the staff. Thank you. I'd like to echo that it's it's a lot of fun to be on that committee and see the kind of um, operation that that we provide to our citizens uh, through that department any other go ahead yeah I know this is just kind of I don't know you got a 98 instead of a hundred what happened was there something that uh, I don't know can be fixed so that next time when you have this. Phosphorus. Phosphorus. You have to come to the microphone, please. Um, it, my, my, own, my only cons I want to help. So if there's something we can do to make this 100, I want to do that. You follow to the saying? farmers upstream. Yeah. That's what that uh, the, the watershed program is supposed to help. It's. Uh, we, had, we went over our 0.95 uh, on one of our results for milligrams per liter. So that's how the scoring goes. The more times you violate your uh, limits that they give us, that's how we, uh, the score starts dropping. So you, you uh, go from an A to a B to a C to a D. It's completely out of our control, 100%. Right. So there's nothing that we could do next time to keep that at 100%? We can't. It all depends on what's coming into the treatment plant and how much. Yeah, we if you want to spend a couple, three, four million dollars. Well, I'm asking because I don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's we do everything we possibly can to take and uh, make sure that we stay nice. within compliance of, of all permit limits. You're doing an excellent job. I just wanted more information. Thank you. Thanks. Any other questions? So we have a motion and a second on the floor. Call the roll, please. Alderman Stray. Aye. Alderman Kavieski. Aye. Alderman Miller. Alderman Rosick? Aye. Alderman Shaw? Aye. Alderman Ellis? Aye. Alderman Zwart? Aye. Okay, moving on to the plan commission. The uh, first item is consider act an ordinance to amend the City of Oconomowoc Comprehensive Land Use Plan 2010-2030 for property located south of Lisbon Road and west of Brown Street, Countercrest Senior Living from urban reserve to high density residential. This is for the first reading. Uh, we need a motion to give it its first reading. Motion made. Second. Jason? Very briefly, we did hold a public hearing on this earlier this evening. During that time, I mentioned that the Plan Commission did uh, review this. They sent this forward with a positive recommendation. It came to you with a 7-0 vote. Um, there was some concerns about uh, the comprehensive plan amendment as well as the ordinance for regarding safeguards. One of the people that spoke during the public hearing came up and said, if we rezone this and and Presbyterian Homes walks away from this project, what's going to happen? Um, the ordinance and the comp plan amendment are for the plans that we saw this evening only. And second, they have a three-year time frame that they have to develop the plans within. Um, that was added as per the request of the Plan Commission, and that's what's in the ordinance that uh, you have in your packets this evening. So there was some safeguards built in to the, um, the rezoning ordinance specific for this project that was discussed at the hearing this evening. Thank you, Jason. <coughs> we'll open up for comments. Seeing none, we have a motion and a second on the floor. Call the roll, please. Alderman Stray. Aye. Alderman Kavieski. Aye. Alderman Miller. Aye. Alderman Rosick. Aye. 
Alderman Shaw. Aye. Alderman Ellis. Aye. Alderman Swart. Aye. Your next item is consider act an ordinance to conditionally zone re uh, recently annexed lands located south of Lisbon Road and west of Brown Street, the Town of Crest Senior Living, to residential multi-unit high district, as this is for its first reading. The motion to approve the resolution. Uh, oh, so moved. Second. 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 It's been seconded. No other comments. It's basically the, been discussed. Any comments? I'd just like to make a comment that um, when we were receiving uh, comments from citizens earlier, that there was some dissatisfaction uh, expressed in regards to process and, and being heard. Um, I would suggest, uh, at least in my opinion, that council has has heard concerns. There have been revisions made. Um, and I think the project um, and the structure of that project that's before us now is is better than it was when it first came forward. Um, so I, I, I'm in support of this, but I just wanted to speak to that uh, specifically um, so they, that citizen knows that those concerns were, were heard, um, and I think we address those uh, concerns appropriately. Thank you. Any other comments? Seeing none, we have a motion and second on the floor. Let's call the roll, please. Alderman Stray. Aye. Alderman Kavieski. Aye. Alderman Miller. Aye. Alderman Rosick. Aye. Alderman Shaw. Aye. Alderman Ellis. Aye. Alderman Swart. Aye. Okay. <coughs> Next item is consider act an ordinance to create a planned development PD 23-18 for property located at the northeast corner of East Wisconsin Avenue and Lapton Streets, Casey's General Store. We need a, a motion to give the ordinance. It's so moved. Reasons. Second. Jason? Thank you, I'll give a few comments. Uh, the plan commission did review this uh, PD ordinance back on May 9th of 2018. Um, it does come to you with a positive recommendation. It was a split vote, it was five to two. Um, there was some discussions by the plan commission about um, the expiration date and that was incorporated into the PD ordinance. It, typically is a five year time window for them to, um, to build the uh, facility. The plan commission asked that that be changed to only two years. So that was changed in the ordinance, reduced from five years to two years. Um, th this did come before uh, the plan commission and common council and there was public hearings held and there was um, concerns raised at those meetings by the neighbors, by some of the, the members of the city, uh, they've made a lot of changes since uh, those previous plans. And I'd like to just kind of outline some of the things that why is this back before you? Um, for example, I, as the city zoning administrator, had concerns with their lighting. They had lighting into the residential property just to the north of them. Um, they've changed that. They've restructured their lighting and they have zero light levels going on to the adjacent property. Uh, they supplied a lot more truck movement diagrams, and I put some of those in your, your packet so you can see. They put different size trucks, um, they, they, uh, they showed different um, vehicles, pedestrian, you know, uh, customer vehicles. They showed the big tankers coming in of how they can maneuver without hitting other things. So that's all um, was to be in the packets. Um, they have a physical barrier now along the sidewalk. They have um, traffic um, impacts have changed. They said before the $100,000 would be for just Sheldon Road. Now that $100,000 is on any public safety uh, transportation related thing that the city thinks it needs. Um, the increased uh, pavement setback along Wisconsin Avenue, they've increased that another several feet. So when you're walking along the, the sidewalk, uh, they were able to squeeze that a little bit. Um, they provided additional information on the underground tanks and uh, they offered, uh, the, or they provided now the offer to purchase on the lands to the north. We didn't have that before. They told us they did tr attempt to get that property. Um, now we have the, uh, the actual offer to purchase with the amount of the value of, the, of the, what the offer was for is blacked out. But so they did do, I feel, everything um, that that they possibly could um, in order to make the site work. They still are asking for re relief of 10 feet uh, from the adjacent property. We have a typical 
20 foot rear yard setback and they're encroaching 10 feet into that. Um, so I'd be happy to answer any other questions uh, this evening. Thanks, we'll open it up for discussion. Lou? Uh, so they, they have an offer to purchase, is that active in negotiation, is that moving down a road or is that just a, a no, they give you X number of dollars? They made an offer uh, to the uh, Mr. McMickle, the, the property owner, and they gave him a time frame to respond by, and he chose not to respond or counter. So it's a null and void table. at this time. Right. But they, they did provide that. Mm -hmm. So okay. So we would have to approve that variance um, with that setback in order for this development to move forward. Correct. And if we weren't prepared to do that, then we should vote in negative of this? You would vote against it, yeah. Um, Derek? Does this, does this take a 5 7 or a, a oh. it, it just so takes a majority, a majority, majority for a PD? It doesn't take. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I was, um, I was concerned. I was at that meeting, and uh, two guys, the Dean, when you guys are, I, I respect their opinions very much so on uh, uh, the setbacks and everything else the rest about Casey's. I, I still have a little concern. I mean, it's nice that they redid a lot of things that uh, uh, people, they listen to people, they move the things around. Um, but I, I thought you were telling me that they were expecting only like one tanker truck of a week in there. You, you were coming around with there with the traffic, you know, going in and out of there. So uh, 20,000 tank, uh, fuel. No, not, um, the attorney that represents Casey and Angie Black, who spoke earlier, uh, is here. She gave a letter, and the letter was in your packet. They talked about one uh, delivery vehicle, not the tanker truck, but the, the, the for the store. Yeah. Uh, that was anticipated at one truck per week. Then there'd be uh, that's the large truck. Then they have several smaller ones that would come throughout the week, but uh, the one large delivery truck in the letter was stated as only w once a week. Um, we talked about the time of day of the deliveries and that would be restricted um, as well. Well, the tanker trucks aren't too small. They're 55 feet, 60 feet, so they right. could- those, they those could be more than once a week. Yeah, well, right. they better be. They won't be selling any gas because it's like 5,900 <laughs> 5, gallons <laughs> in, in, in that part. So, I, but I, I'm still, you know, that roadway out in front is just a hazard, and I just, I'm afraid. Uh, I've seen some near misses. I saw somebody get pushed up uh, in front of that house. This car probably fit in with all that junk that's laying around that road. Um, uh, you know, I just, it, it just scares me. And trying to put that property, what they wanted to do, and there's like 10 pounds of salt in the four pound bag. And, and I also have a com concern even with the, uh, uh, all the technology because it is overlaying one of our wells out there. And I know there was a gas station next to it, but I just worry unless they have a backup generator that, uh, that part. so that's my concerns, that's it. Lou? So this is uh, kind of an interesting one, I, I think, because we have, uh, as a council, has, have determined that we are not in the business of uh, deciding winners or losers. Uh, we're potentially the, uh, the most appropriate location for a, a business may be or may not be if that business has done their homework and uh, decided that's where they want to put their flag. Um, there are other areas of concern for this particular development um, that I think we have some precedence to, to continue moving down the road. Where I really have a problem is that that 10 foot uh, setback. They did make a, a and, and I think um, you represented the city well in negotiating um, this project uh, to the best extent possible. Um, but we have a homeowner that's not selling and we would infringe upon their um, their right to have that setback in place. And I, I think for that reason, um, from a policy standpoint, I'm not gonna support uh, moving this forward. And I think um, we should think about what precedence that 
particular element of this project would set? Fairly? Lou, I agree with you on that. That's why I was opposed to this. Um, I was hoping with all the time that Casey has taken this back to redesign it, that that setback, they would you know downsize a little bit and get that setback out of there. But with that, trying to waive that setback, I can't support that either. Mike? Yeah, I agree with both you guys. And it's just such a tough intersection. Mm -hmm. That right turn that you're supposed to turn right, everybody zips into the left. That's just, I, you know, I love Casey's. We go there to Boscobel and Sandomir all the time. But I just can't support that because of that. Any other comments? Eric? Yeah, I voted against this at the uh, plan commission because of the fact that it, it didn't fit our, our zoning and that's that's what we put it in place for. And if they if they wanted it bad enough, they could have made an offer that the guy couldn't refuse on his property. That's my, my opinion of it. And they wouldn't probably have to give us 100,000 either then, right? Would they have to give us 100,000? They never did have to give it to us. No. Right. No, that if it conforms to They could have taken that 100,000 and used it towards that. So th what I'm saying, I don't know what the offer was. I tried to find out. Um, <laughs> I know that it, I, I'm not going to say any more about it. I, I found out something, but I'm not even going to bring it up. But anyway, my point is, is if they wanted it bad enough, they would have made an offer to the guy they couldn't refuse, and then, then we couldn't have prevented it, in my opinion. Um, and that didn't happen, so I'm not in support of it. Uh, yeah, I guess I, I'm on the other side of things, despite how many folks came out and spoke. Um, I was a bit taken back by that bunch of the people that did come out and then as soon as they were all done talking walked away instead of waiting to hear us debate the issue after some folks came up and actually said they don't get enough information and they don't see us b debating issues enough everyone walked out um, not waiting the time to actually hear the debate and hear what we discuss and decide um, so I, I was struck by that I was struck by some of the things the folks said about you know how hard it is to get to meetings they have you know jobs and kids well you know I think we all do on the council and we do very carefully look at this stuff but I don't think we should be in the business of just denying someone because they need a small setback I, I'm curious Jason how many other businesses have we gave them uh, side yard or side lot setback um, revisions to or variances to I haven't researched that I, I think we're up to about 25 uh, planned development districts within the city. Uh, some of those may have been for some setback encroachments. Some may not have needed that relief. I'm not really sure. Um, but we, you know, we do give PDs uh, for, for unique situations. Right. And, and this is a unique situation. I don't think they should have to overpay someone behind them who doesn't want to move or doesn't want to sell. Um, the folks behind there in the, the, the Golden View Estates or whatever um, built homes or moved into homes above a commercial strip. Um, there's Laurelbergs, there's an auto parts store, there's other gas stations within just a few blocks. Um, we shouldn't be in the business of deciding winners and losers. And I think right now that's what we're doing through the auspices of saying we're not going to give an extra 10 feet of space to someone, uh, to the house behind them. Our planning department has recommended this. Um, I don't think we should be turning businesses away, and I don't think the argument for me carries a whole lot of water that, <laughs> you know, well, there's another gas station up the road, okay? And we, I've, we, I've had this philosophical discussion several times on this council. Well, what happens if another burger joint comes in and wants to build next to Arby's? We're going to say, well, you can't. Or, you know, some other type of burger place next to Culver's. You can't because it might infringe on Culver's ability to sell burgers. We, that's not our job. And if we're using the side yard setback as essentially a way just not to vote for this project, I, I disagree with that. Um, now, if they get that fixed, I, I think uh, <coughs> then we need to obviously vote in favor of it. Um, the, the only thing I'll, the only comment I'll make is to the attorney who wrote the letter. Um, I think most of it was pretty right. I, I, maybe I'll talk to Stan about that later as well. Um, but you did put a, pour a little gas in the fire by saying these concerns and preferences do not provide a basis, blah, blah, blah. While that may be technically legally true, um, you know, the, the concerns are what we do here. And those things are important to what our decision-making process is. Whether we can actually consider it with the CUP or not is a different question. Um, but I, I think I'm going to vote for this change, and I think we're, we're doing the wrong thing here. Lou? 
Um, I, I'd like to suggest to you that that by using that 10 foot setback, we're, we're, we are protecting the homeowner's rights, which we are in the business of, of doing. Um, they, they could have made the, the offer to purchase that, that home that they, they couldn't refuse, or they could have gone to that homeowner and said, you know what, I, I understand you don't want to move, but if you could at least give me a letter that shows some support or, or none of that occurred. So uh, listening to everybody that came up and spoke, um, I, I don't discount all of what we heard. Um, a lot of it was uh, emotional and that, that's valid, but we, we need to make our decisions based on uh, policy and, and, and law and what we can uh, defend. And homeowners' right associated with that setback um, I think is a very valid reason to to vote against this particular development, not making uh, a decision for winners or losers, but making a decision for a development that has not made the accommodation to fit within or make attempts to get um, letters of, uh, I don't want to say compliance, but um, acceptance of where that development would go as it, is, uh, as it applies to their property line. So, uh, you know, you're going to vote the way you, you, you want to, but I'd, I'd just offer to you that that is my reasoning behind this. Yeah, I'd like to just go on the record to say I'm not voting this down because everybody was in here. That even though they're in my district, I don't care. They, I've listened to them several times, and they, de they, they definitely come in packs. <laughs> nobody, nobody from the rest of the city came here and said no to this. That was everybody. I believe that that was in here was from that subdivision. So, I'm trying to make a citywide decision and be consistent with with our zoning. And it doesn't. I don't believe it fits in there. It doesn't fit our zoning. That's why they're here asking for it. Otherwise, we'd be all voting yes. So, I just I'm just trying to make sure that if we are going to make exceptions it's for exceptional developments not for fuel stations i did i did get some emails from outside of the uh, your district up there but I, i'm going to reiterate it because i i believe it's a safety issue so i'm just telling you that setbacks or not it's just not a feasible road Fairly? Well, i just think that if we allow to build without the setback, you know, that we do waive that and get it that building right up to the property line. We're actually going to trap water on the neighbor's property, and I don't think that's fair to the neighbor that owns that. Because that's where the drainage goes through. Uh, yeah, I'm not, uh, I understand where everyone's coming from, and Derek, just so you know, I didn't suggest that you vote or we're going to vote one way or another based on just people being here <laughs> or anyone. Um, actually, the, the fo folks were actually pretty convincing, uh, which is why I made the comment to the attorney that, uh, you know, um, you shouldn't discount their their personal preferences, even though I think their personal preferences are wrong in this instance. Um, we have other PD overlay districts for probably unexceptional developments in the city um, and other developments in the city that probably bring less tax money to us than this will. So I, I think we have to be careful about what we're doing here. I, you know, look, it's a busy road. I, the other thing folks said is, you know, it's going to get busier. I just... You know, people don't drive out of their way to go get gas and, you know, a bag of chips. Uh, you know, you, you stop at the gas station that's closest to you, I think. I, you know, maybe the pizza is that exceptional that they're going to drive by Domino's and Rosati's and everywhere else and Pizza Hut to get the pizza there. But, you know, the reality is um, we put gas stations in a lot of spots in the city, and we've also um, had problems where we voted down gas stations and spots because we didn't think it was a good enough spot, and we got to be careful. So that's my comment. Any other comments? <clears throat> well, I have a couple, <clears throat> and I want Jason to stay up here for this. Um, <clears throat> we did some research um, on other gas stations that are within the area, the, uh, the three other ones downtown. And do you have the lot sizes for those three stations? This yes. one is a certain size. And I just want to make sure everybody understands what we're, we're talking about here. Because the size See, is lot size is 1.26 acres in, okay. in size. So in, about one and a quarter acres. Um, the mobile is, is uh, 0.67 acres, so that's 
maybe about half the size. Uh, Speedway is um, two, it's actually two lots, um, and that's 0.76 is a combination of, of both of those, so that's um, a little more than half the size of, of Casey's proposed site. And then the, um, the five O's station closest to it is, is 0.58 acres. Okay, so th this site is a third, at least a third bigger than any of the other sites that are currently hosting gas stations. So, so you judge the sizes. Um, <coughs> this station, proposed station, and the BP station sit near well two. I believe it's well two, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. The other two that are just down the street here sit just about the same distance from well one. So the fact that the gas stations are there that have been there forever, um, being near a well, and we've never had an issue with it, really shouldn't be an issue. There's always um, a first. There's always a first time. It could happen at another one, too. And then what do we do? Um, <clears throat> when in 2003, late 2003, early 2004, when this subdivision was being approved, a lot of this, and I had Jason go through and, and look up some of the concerns from the neighbors. and. The same concerns were there for building this subdivision as these people now, these, the people in the subdivision are saying about the gas station. They had issues about safety, they had issues about traffic concerns, they had issues about all sorts of things um, disrupting the life of the way the people are. So it really doesn't matter when a development goes in. Um, and we've had the same issue with other areas. I remember when, when Lake Ridge went in and the um, the Silver Lake Intermediate School went in. There was concerns from that neighborhood specifically about that school being there. It shouldn't have been put in a, in a residential area. That's what the, the neighbors said. Well, it's been there for a long time and it's been doing fine. So no matter what you do, you're gonna get, everybody's gonna be complaining about specific things. So that's something that you have to look at. And then the one, I think it was the first woman that spoke, someone mentioned to her what could go there. Well, I did, I did have a check, and these are, these are things that could be put there. Now, if this gets turned down, and these things could be put there by right, no public hearing, no um, certified um, conditional use permit, none of these. Um, a tavern slash bar slash nightclub could go there. A liquor store, a tattoo parlor, <laughs> a body piercing, uh, massage therapy, um, or a convenience store without gas pumps. So any of that stuff could be built on that site tomorrow without just coming to the plan commission with the, with the plans, architectural. So all those things could be done. And it is a commercial strip. I just wanted to let everybody know those facts before they make their vote. Lou? I, I appreciate um, getting that additional information. And, and again, to reiterate, all of those concerns that you brought up and, and the development um, are, are, are valid, right? But they're encroaching on the rights of a property owner directly to the north with, and, and it's, our, it's part of our job to protect those rights, regardless of the size and the type of development that's being proposed because um, it's not all about the, the money that's being generated by the tax um, or the type of business or service. If, if Casey's really wanted to be there, they would have adjusted their plan accordingly so we wouldn't have that conversation with that setback. And to me, this is a property right owner issue, not a we, we need an extra gas station or pizza delivery or any of that because that is, that is an emotional um, uh, determination. But the, the setback is, is, is part of our policy, part of our ordinance. Well, first of all, Mayor, I think your comments were very well taken and very spot on. Uh, we don't agree on everything, but I think you're right. <laughs> Jason, um, what has the, the property owner to the north that we're going to be quote unquote infringing on um, ever come in and complain, send a letter complaining about the development, objecting to the development, showing up at a hearing, whether planning commission 
Common Council in voicing his concern about the encroachment upon his property rights? That, no. by the way, he never said anything, right? Not that I'm aware of, no. Um, he's never, uh, and again, the, the setback doesn't go into his property. It just means that this building can build or the parking lot can go a little bit closer to the lot line than normally is allowed in that area, right? I mean, we're not building a wall on his property. Correct. We're just saying that something can be built a little bit closer, um, you know, from you to me, to this property owner who hasn't complained, who hasn't um, caused any problems. So that that's my point, and um, I'm still going to vote for it. Okay. Any other comments? Uh, McNichol was here for one meeting. Oh, okay. Planning Commission. And he objected on the record. I, I don't th think he ever talked. No, he didn't. He was just listening. No, I don't think he ever talked. <laughs> I, re I would remember. I would remember. Any other comments? Okay, we have a motion and a second on the floor to um, approve the ordinance to create a planned development unit. Um, of course, an I vote would be for it and a nay vote would be against it. Um, call the roll, please. Alderman Stray? Nay. Alderman Kavieski? Nay. Alderman Miller? Nay. Alderman Rosick? Aye. Alderman Shaw? Nay. Alderman Ellis? Nay. Alderman Zwart? Nay. Okay. Uh, we did new business already. Uh, mm -hmm. Moving on to mayoral appointments. Um, I have an appointment tonight. And uh, tonight I am um, <coughs> I'm going to appoint uh, a gentleman to two, two boards. One is to the Board of Review and one is the, to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, the gentleman is Mark Gempler. Um, Mark Gempler was a uh, four years at the Waukesha County DA, DA's office uh, following uh, U.S. Attorney's Office, then four years as a Waukesha County Corporation Counsel, and after that, 26 years as a circuit judge in Waukesha. He recently retired. He lives in town um, up by uh, Paps Farms, and he came in and uh, wants to be involved. So I think he'd be an excellent choice. I know Stan gave him a very good recommendation. I can vouch for Mark. So. Um, I'd like to appoint him with the council confirmation. I'll make a m motion to confirm the appointment. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, call the roll, please. Alderman Stray? Aye. Alderman Kavieski? Aye. Alderman Miller? Aye. Alderman Rosick? Aye. Alderman Shaw? Aye. Alderman Ellis? <coughs> you were vouching for him? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's so you can vote no. <laughs> Aye. <laughs> Alderman Swart? Aye. Thank you. Okay, uh, staff reports. <laughs> I'm on the clocks. I'm, look, I'm looking at the clock right behind you. Yeah. Well, at least I got two. Yeah. All right. That was a good meeting. <laughs> Great. That's <laughs> Thank you for your. We found out how many you got. I mean, you want dogs to walk around. Button do I push, Jason? On. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Uh, the first report, I want to give you an update, update on the Emerald Ash Borer issue we have in the city of Oconomowoc. Um, I met with uh, Lou on this topic because Merchants Platt, to, to set the background, we have a significant number of ash trees in the street right away. They were marked as being infested with Emerald Ash Borer and it created a stir and, and almost a panic saying what's going to happen they weren't sure so in essence we held a public information meeting on May 8th uh, myself Brian Spencer uh, did the presentation Lou helped moderate the um, session we had about 16 people in attendance and we covered three s significant areas one was educating them on what EAB really is um, what our current operations and plans are and what our operation options would be in the future so real quickly uh, Emerald Ash Borer this gives you a little chart about the life cycle if you're not familiar with it. Um, in the summer, fall, the larvae form an S-shaped galleries and are feeding underneath the bark. So this is an area you don't see, so that this corner photo kind of gives you an idea of what that can look like. The larvae over the winter then uh, in the bark and outer sapwood start working their way out. 
then over to the far lower left corner, they go through a pupation process to become adults, and ultimately the adult begins to emerge in May through August, which is about the time of year we're in now, and the adult only lives two to three months, but they're reproducing and laying eggs of 65 to 90. So that's the life cycle of what we're dealing with here. So this gives you a little idea on what it looks like from going really right to left and what that can look like through those various stages. They're very small. Uh, some of the symptoms, if you're curious what of the symptoms and signs of EAB, this is a, a picture to the left is the woodpecker damage that you'll start to see. Uh, they're trying to get in and get to that larvae. Uh, you can see D-shaped exit holes, and they're literally shaped like a D, so it's an identification piece to see if you have EAB, and those are two of the key things that we see that are very plain in view to our team. There are many others as well, but I'm trying to shorten this up for you. Uh, we first found EAB in July of 16th of 2013, right next to Walgreens over on Thackeray Trail. Uh, big hit in that area already to date. So back in 2011, the, the chart on the left shows you the number of counties that quarantined ashwood. In essence, you could take a tree down, the ashwood's supposed to stay in that county. You don't transport this issue to another county. Just seven, year late, seven years later, you can see on the right-hand side that it was all over our state. So it's a fast-moving issue, it's a serious issue, and it's something that we're trying to deal with. So in 2011, we had over 463 ash trees. Uh, we've been slowly removing them, and we find, uh, for various reasons, sometimes they, they were dying on their own for other reasons, sometimes there was uh, damage, or it was a safety issue, or in this case now, we're, they're being infested with EAB. Now in 2018, uh, we are down to 273 trees, 220 of those are street trees in the public right of way and about 53 in our park system. Our percentages are actually good compared to other communities. I put Merchants Plath up here because they had 29 total trees that were marked in their uh, <coughs> area. 24 of those were street trees and five were in parks or public open spaces. There's some median areas in that subdivision that we had some ash trees. And then the other question we asked them is, you know, how many ash trees do you have on your private property? Those are gonna be your responsibility and it was an education opportunity that they need to think about. So ultimately, how are we handling it? In 2011, we did a comprehensive street tree and park tree inventory. I'm not gonna read all the numbers to you, but you can see the ash tree is in this column at the 429 and it shows a little bit of our diversity and what we're doing in the community. As you know, through the budgeting process, uh, we've had an annual planting program in the range of 13,000 for several years. Over the last two years, uh, you guys supported the initiative of adding an additional $15,000 to give us a total of 28 to address this, ish this issue. And the way we were addressing it at that time was removing trees when we knew that there was an issue, um, taking the trees down, grinding out the stumps, and then replacing those trees with other species. And it's been very successful from that perspective. And obviously that'll be an initiative we'd like to continue for the next couple of years. The bottom statistic talks about how our labor time is spent. And it's, we break it into thirds. So it's give or take a little bit depending on the year. But we spend almost $75,000 in labor and resources to actually do that process on an annual basis, which is part of our normal operating budget. It's just a segment of that. So in 2018, this is another chart showing how the diversity is changing. You see how ash has got down to the 270-ish level and how our other species have become more diversified and gone up in numbers as we're, we don't plant all maple when we take a, a street tree, a street full of ash trees down. We're diversifying throughout that area to minimize the impacts of some future potential disease or insect that comes into our town or city. So we provided options to the property owner so they understood what they can do today related to street trees, um, but also options that they could implement uh, on their private trees as well. So the first option is you do nothing. You leave the tree alone, uh, you let it die its natural course with the um, EAB issue or other issues. You risk creating hazards by doing this because when, the, when these trees die, they could fall, they could create other issues, but you're also losing the opportunity of growth time for planting a new tree every year that you wait. It's inevitable, it's going to happen at some point. Not a great option, but it, it's an option. The second option is on street trees, we're, we're taking the approach of removing trees, 
with signs of EAB or identified as EAB trees, we remove the stump, we replace the tree or trees if they have multiple in the street right away, um, depending on the space available at that time. We pay for those trees through the funding sources we talked about earlier. Um, and then the property owners could then do the same approach for trees on their own private property. One of the things we deal with with this is occasionally we'll have a property owner who refuses to take a new tree. And we rely on them to assist us because we don't have the manpower to go out and water new trees to the number of times that they truly need to be watered. We're, we don't have the resources to do that. So we ask them if they want a new tree. If they're willing, they're usually willing to participate in the watering process and our success rate is significantly higher. If they deny the tree, we will take those funds and resources and plant them somewhere else in our overall comprehensive street tree areas in the city of homeowners that are interested in doing it and participating. The third option is, and there's a series of different treatments you can do, but there's an insecticide treatment of right-of-way trees that a property owner could do. We've created a new form because of the public information meeting and the process we went through to allow the property owner to submit an application. It's called a street tree maintenance request form to Brian Spencer, our Parks and Forestry Superintendent. He's here this evening, sitting way in the back. I told him to be here at 7.30. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> That's what time you wanted to start, right? You'll never make that mistake again. Yeah, right. So anyways, um, he will go out and meet with that individual property owner if they are interested in paying for an insecticide approach. They are responsible for going out and hiring a contractor to come in and actually apply that, and they are responsible for paying for it. What people don't understand at first, they do now when Brian meets with them, is that this isn't a one-time deal. You're paying this either annually or biannually, depending on the process you choose to use, for as long as that tree can continue to win the battle, for lack of a better term. Could it last forever? Maybe. It's probably unlikely, but they're investing into that tree. So over the course of time, it's not just $50 or $100 or $200, depending on your choice. It could be thousands by the, you know, 15 years down the road. So this form really provides homeowners a, a new option, which I think is positive for if they really feel strongly that they want to try to save that tree. But what we're starting to hear and find that when these contractors are coming and speaking with them, they're sharing the same information that we're sharing with them. This tree is too far along. We don't recommend putting money into it. Or this tree is in a stage where maybe you can prolong its life. But understand that at some point we, the replacement may be necessary. So I, I wanted to share with you what took place at the public information meet, meeting. It's a real issue. Um, I, I think the property owners were receptive and, and polite and kind through the process, and we also now create a process for the rest of the city to use if they choose to try to do the insecticide process. So that's all I have on the EAB tonight. Okay. And then you're going to give a report on the uh, yep. two-minute annual report? Yes, sir. <laughs> so... Uh, as you guys all know, we have been doing annual reports for the various departments, and tonight at 11 o'clock is my turn. <laughs> so today is June 6th, uh, <laughs> almost. <laughs> What's that? Way to volunteer for that one. Yeah, I know, I know. Thank you. So here's our team. This is our full-time crew. Uh, the guys with the safety gear on are our maintenance crew. Uh, we've got John Dudley, our parks and forestry foreman. Uh, Eric Olson, Justin Hollitz, um, Tim Butson, and Nathan, oh gosh, thank you, Austin. I knew we had two first names uh, on our team. And then obviously we've got our, our administrative staff, Jennifer Fremming, Paige Brunslick, uh, Jennifer Clayton, and then Brian Spencer and myself. Um, I'm happy to have these guys part of our team. They work hard for us. We hold them to a high standard, and they continue to re meet the challenges that we've been going through over the last few years. So our recreation services, this is a chart showing the change in recreation programs, the number of participants, how many residents and non-residents that are participating on an annual basis. And on the left-hand side, we talk a little bit about some of the new programs that we offer. Uh, each year, we, get, we try to reach out to our existing participants and people that are not participating and offer different styles of exercise and yoga or whatever that may be to continue to keep people interested and stay with the trends. Uh, we tend to be pretty successful with those. The number of classes that actually occur versus the number we offer is a, truly a supply and demand issue. Um, but as you can see, we're very consistent offering in that 
little over 800 range of programs on an annual basis. You can see over the last three years what we've been doing there. Um, our waterfront services is a, a big deal. Uh, people do use City Beach. And there's a lot of people swimming there, but it's more than just open swim. We offer swim lessons. We offer uh, snorkeling and logging. We have watercraft rentals, which is extremely successful. So you can see, just using the watercraft rental as an example, weather drives everything at, at the beach. If you have a crummy year, weather-wise, your numbers are, are, are impacted. Um, if we have a year where we have to close the beach because our water quality isn't meeting what the standards are for safety purposes, we close it down. It's not just closed for the two days where the water's bad. We get it cleared and it's tested through our wastewater our, and water department on, on a weekly basis. But once somebody sees the sign, they're reluctant to come back for a few days. So oh, I'm not sure I want my kids swimming there because the water's bad. I don't want them to get sick and I don't blame them. So those types of factors are always come into play. Uh, but we, we have over, you know, almost had 2,000 rentals of watercrafts back in 2016. Last year we were around 1,500. It's a constant approach. And obviously the admissions and the season passes uh, fluctuate from year to year. And very interest, interested to see what the season bans will be for this year with the new family pass that we've implemented. I know we have people coming into our office getting them um, over the last couple weeks. So it'll be interesting to see how that flushes out. Uh, park services, some of the things we did last year, we put in new playgrounds back here with the water Fowler, our Fowler Waterfront Project. We also put a new one in at Blaine Street Park. Uh, we had some flooding challenges over by, the picture on the left is um, at Roosevelt Park and that fencing you see on the left hand side is the back edge of Imagination Station. It's a low area and we have some challenges there but that requires extra cleaning and other things as it, it, it brings a lot of debris and things into that facility. We've obviously, Fongs was, um, we acquired that and we added some sidewalk to complete the project as part of the Fowler Waterfront project as well. Uh, River, Lower River Bluff Playground, uh, we reestablished the borders and boundaries and made sure that we had the shock absorbing surfaces meeting the standards from the uh, playground safety standards requirements that we follow. So our staff did a great job of making the improvements there. Uh, we redid the extension of the um, performance platform that's at City Beach. You see it on the right side. We went from treated lumber to um, more of a Trex material, which will give us a longer lasting product. And it's, it was needed and it's been beneficial to the Civic Band and the concerts that take place down there. Westover Tennis Courts on the left was completed last year. Uh, we repainted the Boy Scout House at Fowler Park. We talked about Emerald Ash Borer. Uh, but this shows some statistics of trees planted, pruned, uh, removed, and stumps ground. I'm not going to spend much time on that because I gave the report earlier. Um, I will talk about this briefly though. The picture on the far right is all ash tree that we have run through our chipper. And we now use that, and you're allowed to do this, in various parks to under mulch areas and evergreen trees and things of that nature. So we're reusing the materials that we've taken down and saving money on mulch for certain areas. A good example is Roosevelt Park has a large area of um, evergreen type trees between the parking lot and the um, shelter. And you can't get grass to grow in there. So we've added mulch to those areas and we've used ash uh, to do that. And it does not spread the disease because we've put it through and it's the smaller size so it doesn't impact or spread that um, insect, insect issue. We are a Tree City USA for 25 years now, and this year uh, Brian Spencer applied for the Growth Award, and we received it, which means we are investing into our community and in our urban forests. So, uh, Brian, nice job on, on getting that application in and continuing to do what you do to, to reach those significant milestones. Uh, we did refinish the last room at the community center. Um, believe it or not, that room is being rented significantly. Uh, we added an additional fee if for weddings if they want to use that for their um, brides prep area, groom area, et cetera. But we're also getting a lot of other groups to rent that for meetings. Uh, the school district is using it for a lot of testing on a regular basis. Um, so it, it's been a nice improvement prior to the flooring and, and the trim work. It basically was a concrete floor, not real appealing, and now it's a little more inviting. Uh, our, our weddings continue to be successful at the community center. Uh, I, I can honestly say we have gone well beyond what I ever anticipated in the first five years of operation. This next slide shows you a little bit of what we've been doing. 
Uh, and for those of you that may or may not remember, when we first projected the community center rentals, we were hoping to peak at 65 rentals a year. That was the projections on the numbers we used when that project was approved. As you can see in 2017, we had 38 rentals. We had 174 other types of rentals for other groups. Now, one example of that is the Rotary Clubs there on a regular basis. They come about 48 times a year, but it's 48 uses. They're set up, there's takedown, there's things going on. So the, the use is continuing to grow, and on the far right, you can see how our revenue continues to skyrocket. Last year, with our contracts for um, food, uh, the beverages, as well as the rental, we were over $154,000. $15,000 of that every year through our initiative, through budget, goes into a fund for future uh, improvements or replacements for that facility. So if we have a major issue come up, we have, are building a fund to cover that cost through the revenue that's going on. So that's been good. And we're over 91,000 to date this year. Uh, special events, we talked a little bit about that today with the um, public possession and open intoxicants, but we permit over 70, we did 77 special events, which are festivals, runs, parades, et cetera, last year. Uh, it takes a lot of time, and you're working with a lot of volunteers to do it, and I can honestly say we're fortunate to have the number of people that volunteer their time to do these events. It takes a lot of time, a lot of man hours, so we're grateful for that. Um, this is just a list of special events that we, some of the special events that we're managing are involved with in some way. Uh, we also rent our park shelters and athletic fields. Uh, we did 150, excuse me, 109 park sh shelter rentals last year and 252 ball diamond rentals, generating close to $10,000. One of the auxiliary services we offer is discount tickets through our state association. They have contracts with various attractions, primarily in the Wisconsin Dells area, but the Milwaukee Zoo is one of them. We've selected the ones over years that have been most popular to the residents or the people in the surrounding Oconomowoc area. It shows you the number of tickets we sell, so there's a dis you get a discounted rate. There are other ways to get it as well, but it's been a nice service, and our residents appreciate they can get them locally before they head out of town. Uh, we have our downtown or, or community-based banners that we continue to promote the various events and programs that take place in our community. Uh, we've, we're in our third year now of that, and we had 87 of those rentals take place throughout the course of the year. As you know, we acquired the 33 and a half acres for the Northeast Regional Park. We completed the boardwalk project. As you can see the two photos there, I really like the, the one from the sky. It's, it really gives you a good feel on what that turned out to be. Uh, we constructed the new cold storage building and uh, working collaboratively with Department of Public Works. We saw the needs assessment uh, summary tonight, so that was completed, and we implemented new registration and facility software, which included the credit card acceptance at our office and at the city beach, which we had, did not have in the past. Our Did You Know initiative continues to tell our story and promote the different things that we do in our department, and it's been, uh, it's helped us get the word out. It's catchy. People have caught on to the the Did You Know initiative, the hashtag, so to speak. Uh, we have a new football program, if you haven't heard, coming into town, and it's really a collaboration between the school district, the YMCA, and the city. Um, there used to be a youth football board of directors that managed the tackle football program, which started back in 2010. It was run by the city prior to that. Um, tackle football rules, con concussion protocol, training all the key things to, for safety in that physical sport are part of this initiative and the three organizations have worked together to better football and keep kids safe in our community so you'll see that kicking off this year projects for 2018 well eab and planting trees will continue as you know through the budgeting initiatives and then we have our rosano creek trail design and bidding process will begin we're replacing uh, or I should say reconstructing the Fowler tennis courts and basketball courts. That's under process right now. Should be done in uh, another four weeks or so. Uh, we have the planning of the Village Green Pavilion, which will go through the Park and Rec Board and ultimately come back to Council for consideration. Uh, the Transient Boat Dock Pier, which we talked about in our strategic planning briefly today, will be uh, addressed here in the near future to move forward with that initiative. Uh, the trailhead at City Beach is just about done. Uh, we will be putting in those bike racks in the next week or so and we'll have all the sodding and final landscaping completed as well. We have our Roosevelt Field outfield renovations, uh, new playground at Bub Heritage Park, 
Champion Field, which was an uh, initiative that was supported by the council to, instead of doing engineering and design work there, to continue to get some work done. So we're doing some improvements to fencing that was, was falling apart and, and improving the dugout areas there. That'll take place in the fall. And the last thing is the park and open space plan will be updated, which con connects directly to the comprehensive land use plan. So I'm over, I know, but what the heck, it's 10 o'clock, what's the difference? <laughs> All right, Thank you, Mayor. Appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you, John. Any other staff reports? Okay, no. Uh, reports and comments from the mayor. I was I received this when I walked in today. Um, this is a coloring book from Summit School. The fourth graders put together. Um, it's the first ever Oconomowoc coloring book. So it's something that there's. Um, you can download it. There's the uh, little code in the middle there. So it's something kind of cool, and it's got all the kids' names, um, and there's a number with them, and so you can look at the look up the picture, and it's got the number of the kid that did it. So um, very well done, and I'm pretty impressed. I just I said, I'd like to add that it is uh, available on the city website. It's uh, been website. posted out um, on news and announcements, and um, you can download the whole coloring book if you want. This is this is Stan's coloring book. Yeah. Stan's book. This was hot off the press today. <laughs> um, that's all I have tonight. Uh, reports and comments from Alderman. Go ahead, Tom. Uh, according to MK Lifestyle Magazine, a fellow by the name of H. Stanley Riffle has been, uh, there was one of the best attorneys for land use, zoning, evident domain, and condemnation law. How about that? Um, we, we should hire him then. We're, right. we're yeah. Safe. Yeah. Could I get a raise? Um, no. Well, there was there was there was only one other attorney, and they they drew, they drove him away there. So I don't know him there. So. <laughs> Just like to say, I was out over on the Fowler Lake over uh, Memorial Weekend, and every one of those personal spaces was being used on Friday night when I went around there. People were having a great time. The uh, piers were being used by people that were going to the restaurants downtown. Fantastic. Did a great job, and, and thanks for the report too, John. Any other comments? I've got a brief statement. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> what a, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was kidding about the brief part. Yeah. yeah. Um, nice job on the report. And uh, Park and Rec is one of those departments that really provides the glue that holds some of the bigger things together. And they do a great job. So yep. thanks to you and your department. Any other comments? Yeah, yeah. None. We have a, uh, nothing left on the agenda. We need a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye.